Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. I had been working as a forest ranger for almost five years. A ranger's day could consist of anything from collecting firewood to tracking down missing hikers. And my day began like most. I would wake up early, walking into work and grabbing my binoculars. As I was about to drive out of the forest, I got a call. That day, I was given a new assignment. I met up with another colleague, a fellow ranger, and we went to the center of this area where somebody had been reporting hearing strange screaming coming from around a cave system nearby. My partner and I decided that I would be able to handle it by myself. He had other things to do, and this was just another run-of-the-mill investigation for me. After he left, I headed towards that area where there had been several unreported mounds to this cave system. Now, let me give you some information. This cave system runs pretty deep, and there are guided tours. But I also know that this cave system is very expensive, and also has a lot of unidentified entrances and holes that can lead deeper into the system. These are also off trail, so myself, I've never actually experienced finding more of these, although I know hikers have reported finding many, and even leaving makeshift markers to let other hikers know this was an entrance. The parts of the ground here were also dangerous, meaning if you step on the wrong part, the ground below you could collapse, falling into a tunnel. So I had to be very careful about how I approached this entire search. The good news is I wasn't hearing any screaming, so that could be good or bad news. The bad news meaning the hiker, whoever was stuck there, could have been deceased or what. But the good news being that maybe the hiker had gotten themselves out. Anyway, my heart was pounding just by the sheer adrenaline of it. I didn't know why, but something told me to run. It was this feeling in the pit of my gut. As soon as I got there, right around the cavern system, the wind picked up, and everything seemed colder than it already was. A gust. Now I could have begun my investigation in the main entrance, but as I was planning, I heard the scream. It sounded like a person, but they were maybe a couple hundred feet away north. So I marched through the trees, looking, following the source of the screaming, yelling out, Can you hear me? Can you respond? And the screaming ceased. I followed along the rock wall and found this crude hole in the ground, maybe no larger than five feet. It was right by a rotted tree stump with only one branch on it. This, I knew, probably went down into one of the cave systems. This, by the way, was probably no more than 200 feet away from the main entrance. After crouching down, I was able to slide down at a 45-degree angle into this cave system, landing in a small chamber that I think connected to the others. I always carry a flashlight with me, so I took it out and turned it on. As soon as I did that, the caves plunged into darkness as my battery instantly died. That's when I heard a loud crash. I turned around, or I should say, turned to meet the noise and my flashlight popped back on. There, like out of some sort of sick Stephen King novel, was this grotesque figure. Large black eyes covering its entire body, stretching its arms out and moving toward me. Terrified, I wanted to turn and run, but didn't have time, as there was another one of these beings coming from the opposite side of the cave approaching. I turned as fast as I could and fled up the 45 degree incline about the cave. Just as I was turning to climb up, I could hear a third one approaching from directly behind me. Now I had one coming from my left, my right, and behind me. This one, as I turned and looked, was larger than the other two. Completely terrified out of my mind, and the sounds of screaming were now apparent, coming deeper in the cavern. I don't know if it was an injured hiker, or if these things were making the noise, luring anybody into this tiny crevice, this chamber into the earth. Like I said, the opening to this cavern wasn't large, but I never in a million years would have expected to find things like this. This was horror movie status. I didn't tell anybody else about what I found and kept it to myself. After climbing out of that hole, I ran and ran and ran some more, getting back to the station later on. I didn't say a word, and I knew the other rangers wouldn't believe me. And what would I tell them? That I found a cave full of half-arachnids, half-creatures. 
I mean, they'd probably think I was crazy. Now, I've kept this sacred for a while, but how long can I keep it from the rest of the world? Will my story ever be told to other people, or should I just stay quiet about what had happened? Let me just apologize and say I'm sorry for the formatting of the story. I'm a terrible writer, and I am not a storyteller, so I apologize in advance. But these creatures that I saw were unlike anything I've ever seen. They really reminded me if you crossed a tarantula with a human. I mean, these were gross. They made this hissing, clicking noise, too. I know it sounds phony through email, but it's really hard for me to convey emotion properly, at least through written communication. With all the information coming out anymore about missing hikers and seeing strange figures and shapes in the woods, and all the other bizarre happenings of 2020, I figured, hey, maybe now is an okay time to be open about my experiences and hopefully not experience backlash. Growing up, I always felt like my childhood home was haunted. This wasn't just because it was filled with antiques or because our front yard was surrounded by a rusty iron cemetery fence. But I constantly felt watched and had some poltergeist activity as well as sounds that shouldn't be and even some apparitions. One such apparition happened after I dropped off a friend one night. Like me, she also believed in the paranormal and had had experiences. She was interested in coming to my house to see if she was able to experience anything. She began talking out loud, supposedly recounting what the spirits were telling her. She said she could see a man walking up the stairs up to the kitchen, and as she said it, the stairs creaked like someone was actually walking on them. A few minutes later, she said he was coming back down, and the creaking happened again. Eventually, we got bored, and I took her home. I hadn't actually seen anything at that point, only heard the stairs creaking. As I pulled back in my driveway after dropping her off, I had a clear view of the kitchen window. I saw a figure standing in the window and thought nothing of it since my mom could often be seen in that window doing the dishes. I just figured my parents had come home and she was getting started on them. However, right as I stepped out of my car, it occurred to me that my parents' cars weren't in the driveway. I was the only one at the house. I quickly jumped back in my car and called my parents. They had a good laugh thinking like usual I was just being weird. But I was absolutely terrified. I'm not sure if it was that man my friend said was going up and down the stairs or something else. But it's the only time I ever saw a figure in that window. When camping with my buddies on Canyon Lake, about an hour or two outside San Antonio, Texas. This night was drenched in very bizarre occurrences, and I remember it as one of the worst nights of my life. We were swimming, fishing, drinking beers. Then things got strange. Living in a big city, I rarely got to see stars in myriads, clear and ineffable. I was admiring them with a buddy, until what looked like ten shooting stars began zooming off in different directions. My heart was racing, and I couldn't believe what we had just saw. Once the off faded, couple buddies and I went into the wooded area to play drunken hide and seek. We paired up. Not five minutes in, we hear our friend yell loudly. We rushed towards his voice. He was hunched over by a tree. He looked at us and shook his head saying, Dude, red eyes. I saw red eyes just staring at me, not more than ten feet away so we all ran back to camp. It sounded like a cliché prank, but my buddy still to this day sticks to his story and has trouble being alone at night. Finally, to end the night, we retired to our tents. I had a compartment tent with some friends. I was sitting outside of it with one of them when our buddy Percy walked up saying something under his breath. He finally started raving about how he needs to go home and he can't be there any longer and he started holding his head and he fell to his knees. We tried to console him and he got aggressive, got up and pushed me hard into the tent. I got upset and he said I didn't understand. I don't know what he was talking about and neither did he because he swore up and down that it never happened and that he'd never say things like that or push me. I will not be returning to Canyon Lake.
true story. I went on a Bigfoot finding expedition last fall in Oklahoma. I went with a buddy who had been on a few and who would turn down some camping time. I would have categorized myself as a serious skeptic at the time, especially after last summer's Bigfoot hoax. Everybody on the expedition seemed pretty knowledgeable about the outdoors, open and very honest. We hiked some at night and some of the more experienced ghost tried wood knocks and calls. Sometimes they would get a very faint answer. Whether it was the real deal or a local half a mile off having fun, I couldn't tell, and I wasn't entirely convinced. We did hear something in the camp near our tent at night, as there were some dead leaf cover. It definitely sounded bigger than a raccoon or opusum. Other members pointed out what they said were tracks in the leaves nearby. Nothing definitive, mind you, but they were kind of foot-shaped and dwarfed my friend's size 17 boots. My buddy and I got to go off with some very cool Gen 3 night vision equipment later in the weekend. He's about 6 foot 7 and 400 pounds, so he's no wallflower. We were about 1,000 meters or so ahead of the rest of the group on an old logging road, and we were watching some bats flying around through the night vision. I suddenly had a very uneasy feeling like I was being watched, and the hair on my neck immediately stood on end. About three seconds later, my friend whispers, something isn't right. We need to go back to the group. I have to admit my uneasy feeling went to genuine fear pretty quick. We never told anybody else about it, but he admitted that he had the same exact feeling and was pretty damn scared. All of this could have a rational explanation, pranks or the like, but it was pretty damn creepy. I'm not convinced there is something out there, but shook my skeptical view. My family owns a farm near the Missouri or Iowa border, and I've had a few unsettling experiences where I felt as though I was being followed, triggering the instinctual fight or flight response. We have come across freshly killed deer, and there was recently a young cougar shot on a farm a few miles away, indicating the presence of a fully grown one in the area. One particular experience left me so frightened that I refused to go back there. Behind Fort Leavenworth lies the Missouri River, with miles and miles of swamp and forest that are off-limits to people. One night, we were camping a few miles downstream from the fort. Equipped with a high-powered spotlight emitting millions of candle power, we directed its beam toward some points that jutted out into the river. On one of those points, something reflected back at us two eerie yellow eyes. As soon as the spotlight illuminated the reflections, they swiftly retreated back into the depths of the forest. About an hour later, as we sat by our campfire fishing, a large rock flew over our heads and plunged into the water in front of us. Startled, we hastily left the area and sought refuge in the city park where other campers were gathered. The next morning, we returned to the campsite and discovered the rock that had narrowly missed us. It must have weighed around 25, 30 pounds, and the location from which it was thrown was uphill from where we were seated, defying any logical explanation. My hunting partner Ed and I were into the second week of the Oregon bow season. It was about six when we came upon a stock pond. These ponds are fed by a small spring or small creek. We decided to circumnavigate it to see if we could see what was watering in the area. I went left, Ed went to the right. I hadn't gone far when I came to a depression in the muddy gravely pond edge. It looked like a very big heavy person had left a footprint there. I got down and saw that there were toe impressions at the front. Well, I called Ed over to see this, and he said there was another one behind the first. We backtracked the prints and found what appeared to be skid marks on the hillside of the pond. This was just next to the small trickle of water which fed the pond. The hair on the back of my neck stood right up. We went up the hill for about 40 yards, but found indistinguishable impressions in the trashy undergrowth. We went back down and tracked them in the other direction, and the impressions overturned pebbles. Broken and bent grasses went about 100 yards down a hill into a ravine thick with manzita and small scrub oak. We then went back to the foot tracks and covered them with logs so they wouldn't be destroyed. 
went home and got some plaster of Paris. We made the impressions and we were shocked to find that there were definitely toes on one cast, the other was in too much gravel to make a good impression. At the same time I took some pictures of Ed stretching to match the stride of the prince. The next week we went into the same area, same skid road, about 300 yards past the stock tank. We were walking side by side when something to my left and slightly behind us, up the hill approximately 100 yards something caught my eye. I spun around to see what it was, and to my astonishment I saw a pair of legs running into the thick underbrush. I couldn't see all of it because of the trees. My impression was of a two-legged creature animal, with long brown hair on the legs running away from us. Ed saw the branches swinging back into place, but saw nothing else. We both got spooked and quickly went back to the truck and never hunted there again. I gave the plaster cast to my nephew in San Jose, California, and have never seen them again. I still have the photos of Ed stretching to match the stride. The footprints measured 18 foot long by 6 across the heel, and 8 foot across the ball of the foot. I got some hair samples from a star thistle down in the ravine, and I still have them. I have to preface this story by saying that what I'm about to recount is a true story. I know it sounds like something out of a horror movie, but I assure you, every word I'm about to share is as real as the road I drive on. My name is Jack, and I've been a trucker for over a decade. I've seen my fair share of strange things on the open road. So it was a usual route for me, driving along a desolate highway late at night. The moon was obscured by heavy clouds, casting an eerie glow over the barren landscape. That's when I saw him, standing on the side of the road, thumb outstretched. The hitchhiker seemed ordinary enough at first glance, dressed in worn-out jeans and a tattered jacket. With a sigh, I decided to offer him a ride. Little did I know, that decision would alter the course of my life forever. As the journey progressed, I couldn't shake an unsettling feeling. Strange occurrences began to unfold, and I started to question my decision to pick up this hitchhiker. The air in the cab grew heavy with an otherworldly presence, and I caught glimpses of an unnatural shadow out of the corner of my eye. It was as if the very fabric of reality was shifting around us. Then, without warning, the hitchhiker's face twisted in agony, and he vomited onto the floor of the truck. I immediately pulled over, concern etched across my face. Are you okay? I asked, my voice trembling with worry. But as I glanced at him, something unfathomable happened. The hitchhiker's body convulsed and contorted in an inhuman manner. His form began to change before my eyes, morphing into a creature that defied all logic. It was a creature I struggled to find words to describe, but I'll do my best. It was completely white, bald, impossibly thin, and its humanoid shape lacked any discernible facial features. No eyes, no nose, nothing. It loomed over me, crouched in a position that made its true height difficult to determine. But let me tell you, it was towering at least nine feet tall. Fear coursed through my veins, overpowering any sense of rationality. In a panic, I threw open the door and sprinted as fast as my trembling legs could carry me. I didn't look back. I didn't dare. Only after what felt like an eternity did I finally slow down and catch my breath. But the creature was nowhere in sight. It hadn't followed me. After gathering my wits, I cautiously made my way back to the truck. My heart sank as I realized it was empty, as if the hitchhiker and the creature had vanished into thin air. Confusion and dread consumed me. To this day, I can't explain what I saw or what became of the hitchhiker or the creature. All I know is that my encounter that night was undeniably real. Growing up, we had a big house on the water set back a couple acres from the road. Most of the land around us was swamp, and when I was 14, my dog brought up part of a human arm. Mom and I were binging Heroes 2007 and Biscuit got out. We ignored him and I saw the dog rush past the library window with what looked like a big all fish swinging in his jaw. I go onto bed and she hollers for me and comes to my room wide-eyed. I don't know what this is, 
I go out and it's past the truck and garage and the wide empty space that was there. I shine a light on it and I'm not quite sure what I'm seeing. It's a piece of flesh with three little bones sticking out of one end. My vision does a complete 360 and I curse and look at mom who looks terrified. Ma, you need to call the cops. The police show up, poke it with a stick, then put it in a bag and hold it out the window as they drove to the substation. We later heard reports on CNN about people being cut up and their bodies strewn all along the panhandle. The arm was large and flabby with what looked like a small pox scar. Our area used to be a hiding place for criminals and bodies. People used to find corpses in their yards after heavy rains. We even had a guy break out of prison transport and run through our yard in the middle of the night. Gotta love Florida. I was around 15 years old and lived and still living there in the wonderful Bavarian landscape in a small village. As you might know, we in Bavaria are proud of our tradition and our beer, and so we had something what you would call a party or carnival, only for people of our village. As I was the cool boy in our village, I told the other kids what we can play. We played football soccer first, but I got bored and asked my friends if we are going to run around the village and play with our wooden and a friend of mine, even had a softer, just a weak one, though guns. So we went into barns and, and all that stuff and shoot each other. It was great fun. Till one point we were in a barn of an old farmer, but everyone liked him because he always gave us sweets and told us funny things. He was 83 at that point. One room of the barn was the old slaughter room. When we played in there, in front of us was an old door, but it was locked. But I could have sworn I heard something like a quiet clicking. Generally, it was a really old barn, and my dad told me that it has some underground tunnels and rooms cause of the World War Room II. The years did pass, and the old man died. His wife died almost 10 years ago, and the only son and heir decided to demolish the old barn. What they found in the room with the locked door is still kinda a mystery and police and news were all at the place, but nobody besides the police and the special teams knew what it was. Later the newspapers got the information that there was an old bomb of the WW2. But fortunately my dad helped the son with the work and saw it first together with the son. He never told me till a few months ago. Until that day, only few people knew the real story. He basically built something like a throne of old WW2 souvenirs as a national coat of arms and pictures of Hitler. There were old radios and metal of Nazis, and a lot of letters in which he wrote about operate behind enemy lines, and in which he wrote to his wife and that she has to be quiet. In the middle of the room there was the bomb and it was indeed still ticking and one of the best obtained bombs of the world war and is now in a museum. Diffused. No one knew he was that guy. I was so shocked and I can only tell you that people in our village still tell rumors about more tunnels and hidden rooms. I was on my golf cart by myself and it was completely dark outside and quiet. I live in a neighborhood surrounded by farmland and woods throughout various spots. I was driving but pulled over because this giant beetle was on my shirt. It pinched me and freaked me out. I pulled over next to a stretch of woods and struggled to get it off of me. In the woods nearby I heard walking, like perhaps a deer walking around, so I wasn't scared. Yet the sounds got louder and closer. The walking had gotten so loud it sounded unreal something out of Jurassic Park like a dinosaur stomping. The walking had gotten overwhelmingly loud and extremely close, so I slammed on the gas and get the F out. I looked behind me but couldn't see anything, but felt shivers down my spine because I swear it was inches behind me. Not sure if this has anything to do with it, but I was talking about skinwalkers with my sister and doing some research. So I hope that didn't invite anything but I can't even describe how loud the stomping was. It sounded unreal and was seriously terrifying. My partner and I first heard these stories from a co-worker who overheard another officer talking about it. We thought and were convinced they were making the whole thing up. 
But one night, me and my partner decided to drive around the park to see if we can find anything weird for ourselves. We head down this lone dirt road, tall grass on either side, and suddenly three deer burst out in the dark to our right. Our headlights caught them moving just as they ran into the trees on the left. So naturally, we could tell they were being chased by something. We turned off the headlights and began moving very slowly, keeping an eye out for anything big. We drove slowly, more and more down the winding road until finally, something came into view in front of us. It looked like a large, hairy man crouched over. And as soon as it came out, you could just see its silhouette against the cold night sky. And since it was so dark, I couldn't see much. But the thing kind of turned around and began moving in our direction, and then moved away. As soon as my partner and I saw it, we got this really weird feeling, like something terrible was about to happen. So we quickly turned our headlights on. By that point, it was already gone. We pulled out of there, left pretty quickly. I don't even want to acknowledge what that could have been. I don't think I'm ready to accept that reality just yet. My uncle usually hosts winter parties at his house every year. One year his basement was flooded, so we had no choice but to hold the party somewhere else. It was held at a nearby lodge. On the side of the lodge was a road, and across the road was a small section of trees with a pond in it. An hour or two before the party ended, my cousin and I were outside near that road. We heard a noise coming from the trees, which sounded like something stomping in the pond. Note that when I say stomping, I really do mean stomping, not just some animal swimming around in there, like something was deliberately and forcefully doing God knows what in that pond. My cousin and I went inside and told our other cousin, and the three of us went back out. Being teenagers and all, we decide, hey, let's throw rocks. So that's essentially what we do. A few rocks in, another rock lands in front of us. Whatever was in there threw a rock back. We all went back in and told our other cousin, our older and more smart cousin, who decided, hey, let's go over there. We start heading over to the trees, and pretty much as soon as the older cousin sets foot on the grass, the stomping gets faster and louder, as if whatever it was was running at us. We all ran back into the lodge and stayed inside for the rest of the night. True, this could have been a person, but it just doesn't make sense. What were they doing in there that late? What were they doing in there at all? I still think about what it could have been. It doesn't help that my cousins don't even remember. So there's a mountain range known as K.R. Kenosh separating Poland and the Czech Republic. About eight years ago, I was coming back from Prague to Rocklaw and missed the last bus from the Czech side Herichov to the Poland side Szklarska Porpa. It was summer, about 7 p.m., so there was still a lot of light. I decided to cross the mountains through a low pass, figured I'd reach Poland before dawn. The journey had been uneventful until about 2 a.m. That's when I started hearing a high-pitched, wailing sound. It sounded a lot like a whale's call. It felt terribly sad and lonely. I started looking around, searching for its source. The moon was high and the sky was clear, so the visibility was really good. I saw it among the trees about a 100 meters from me. It was moving slowly, carefully testing the ground before proceeding. Its siren's call made me shiver. The creature looked like a giant spider with a bat's head placed on a long, thin neck. Its ears were huge and probably highly sensitive it turned its head as if noticing my presence, but it didn't seem to mind me and continued to move slowly and wail. It was about three meters long, one five meter tall. It didn't do anything paranormal except for well existing. What I felt wasn't exactly terror, it was more of awe and profound sadness. I remember thinking it might be the last one of its kind, that its calls had been a dying song. After watching it for a few minutes, I proceeded to follow the trail and eventually reached the town of Szklarska Porba around 5 a.m. I remember feeling really strange for a couple of days afterwards. This was on an elk hunting trip. 
My friend and I was going to meet one of our party at a point on a road in the early evening. While walking along the logging road, we came up on these huge tracks in the road. They were on the road and off the road into the trees, then back onto the road like it was wandering. And also there were more than one size tracks. Some were smaller than the others. The farther we walked, the more tracks we found. By the time we met our friend, we thought we wouldn't say anything and see what he would say about the tracks. He said, well, I didn't see any elk, but these tracks are all over the place. We headed back to camp and the next day we headed home. There is no doubt in my mind that these tracks were made by a mighty big creature. The tracks were about 18 inches long and 8 inches wide on the big ones, and maybe 15 inches on the smaller ones. They had to be very heavy to crush the hard snow down to the roadbed like it did. I was walking down this old overgrown road just after sunset. I was hunting with my dad, but he was like a couple hours up the trail besides me. Because the area we were hunting in is known for cougars, I was carrying a pistol along with my 300 caliber Savage hunting rifle. We were black-tailed deer hunting. Anyways, along the way up I got this really spooky feeling. I picked up my pace and grabbed my flashlight out of my backpack. I kept on walking. Then after a good 20 minutes of walking I unchamber my rifle and sling it so it's easier to carry because it's been 30 minutes past sunset. I'm still walking, I got like a mile left on the trail. That spooky feeling just keeps on getting more intense. I start picking up my pace. Eventually I hear a loud stick break to my left behind me, up on top of the hill. Turn around and shine my light and see it for a second, and I swear it looked like a cougar so I got out my pistol and loaded the chamber. I shouted loudly at it to try to scare it off, seemed like it worked. I put the safety back on and holstered the weapon. I start jogging, only like one-fourth mile left. Then like 100 feet before I get to the end of a road, a jackrabbit hops out and starts flying my way. Me being spooked as shit, I pulled my pistol and shot at it twice. I hit it once and it went down. As it's clearly dead, I run the truck, where my father is waiting, as he's scrambling to grab his rifle to see what the F happened. As I run up to him, he asks what the F was that, and I tell him. He then tells me to calm down and helps me take off my backpack. After 10 minutes or so, we go back to go collect the rabbit, but it's missing. I see the pool of blood where it died, right next to some cougar tracks. We don't hunt there anymore. I grew up in rural Oregon in the Coast Range. This is a mountainous area that is technically a northwest rainforest. Heavy undergrowth, untouched in most of the spots that we spent time in as kids. We weren't afraid of the forest. Our house backed right up against it. Atop that, we had a guard dog that would start barking like a maniac if anyone or thing wandered near the property. While my friends and I were playing that stupid game at twilight where you shoot an arrow in the air, and then run around hoping it doesn't fall and pierce your brain. A novice archer haha, -ha, we all were shot one arrow that went way off and landed out somewhere in the trees. My two friends and I wandered into the forest towards it, but stopped looking almost immediately, seeing a strange green glow. The glow we found while trudging in deeper was due to worms on leaves. Glowworms are a thing apparently and a surprise because this was the first time we'd seen them. Well, we did what kids do, started collecting them. The next moment is frozen in my head because of its abruptness. Head down, pursing the leaves for worms, a loud crashing started up just up the mountain from us. This wasn't far away though, it was really close, meaning whatever it was had been there while we rifled through the plants. Two of us saw the cause, something very large and on two legs running down the hill at us. I would have thought human, except I could see the outline, and this thing had no head over its shoulders. So, hulking headless thing running at us through the sword ferns and the fallen trees, we got the F out of there. Not to mention we weren't far from home. Maybe 5,000 feet. I don't remember hearing anything past the run which came out of someone's mouth. My parents didn't believe me. 
There really aren't any bears out in that area, just cougars and bobcats. I went back out the next day to verify that both the glowworms and the headless thing were real, but found evidence of neither. It was later on in my life that I saw the worms again, but never the headless. Whatever. Now keep in mind that I am very skeptical and don't even trust my own memory. If there was something like that in the woods, we'd have found some evidence. No one was camping in that area because, well, we'd have seen them at some other point. I grew up wandering the forest constantly, but the primal fear of being chased remains. Good day. Recently I went on a camping trip and ended up camping in the Black Hills National Forest in South Dakota. Nothing out of the ordinary besides a warning of bad weather and a general uneasy feeling going in. I assumed it was just anxiety from driving all day and the fact that I haven't tent camped without a group in years. I'm outdoorsy and trusted myself. I'm extremely respectful to land, especially forest, and was picking up garbage and burying waste when I found it. Me and my girl arrive to the site rather late. It's last minute, and we decide to camp not too far off a dirt road in a designated camping spot with the tent and blankets in my truck. We set up the tent and watch the sun set before falling asleep in the tent. I have the feeling to leave my firearm locked up in my truck for some reason and decide to listen to my gut on this one. We crawl into bed and drift off to the sound of rain in the forest. I knew it was the anniversary of the Deadwood Flood, but I don't pay too much mind to it. I awake at an unknown time to the sound of the tent zipper being opened. I sit straight up and see a face of pure black staring at me in the darkness with a massive grin on its face. All I can make out is eyes and a smile. I'm frozen in terror and blink a couple times to find it gone and the tent untouched. My girl who was laying next to me asks me if I'm okay and I just say it was a nightmare, but I was okay and not to worry about me and to go back to bed. She falls asleep and I lay staring at the rain cover frozen in shock for a few hours. I've had night terrors or hallucinations, but nothing like this. It was too real, and it was too vivid to be a dream. This is her first time camping, so I decided not to tell her in fear of scaring her away from something we both discovered we enjoyed together. I taught her to leave everything better than how you found it, and how to be respectful and responsible, and there was no bad intentions from either of us. I haven't paid much mind to it until tonight after talking about it with my roommate. I took it more as a warning than a threat. I've had spiritual encounters multiple times in my life, all of which being positive and giving me guidance, but this was different. Not a single word was spoken, and I was genuinely scared for the first time. We left in a hurry with the excuse of getting on the road. I'm still freaked out. I'm mostly seeking guidance on recourses and to get opinions on what this could be. Don't normally follow this kind of community, so excuse me if I missed anything. Feel free to ask questions. I work as an inspection clerk for a real estate agency in a medium-sized town mining town. Needless to say, I see a lot of houses. It's worthy noting that a lot of houses are creepy as hell. With big inspections, I could be in the house till it's getting dark out. In my job, I take pictures of a range of categories in an area, for example, walls, ceiling, windows, floor, cupboards, you get the picture. Noises, ticks, and tacks are common accurates. I attribute them to the house settling, or the roof getting hot and cold, etc. One day, one of the agents comes to me and asks me to go do an inspection on a house she was too freaked out to do herself. This house had my hair on edge the moment I got in the front door. I would describe my feeling as an urge to get out, or that I am in danger. From the start my senses are up in arms. They normally are as I am always aware that someone could come in behind me. I always lock the gates and main doors behind me because of this. Putting my feelings aside, I start my work. Doing the entrance the dining room and get to the living room. There is a door to the front yard in the living room and I note that the windows, door, and curtains fixtures are of an old style, so I note the house must be pretty old. 
I start by hearing someone's feet shuffling coming from the hallway behind me like the morning in slippers going to make coffee with a yawn type of shuffle. I pause for a bit and listen, but it doesn't happen again so I go back to work. Down the hallway there is a mirror at the end with two rooms on my right and two bathrooms to my left. I go into the first room on the right. I notice a strong odor and think it must be the carpet turns out it was rotten. A lot of stains on the carpet and as I'm typing this out I hear a voice. I thought it was the agent checking up on me, so I walk to the front door and see nothing. So I go back to work feeling a little more on edge. I go back to working marking down the stains on the carpet and this time hear a distinctive no. I stop dead in my tracks and start looking around the room really freaked out. I finish the room and head to the main bedroom. I finish up the room without much happening. I am walking out of the room into the hall typing notes on my phone. Out of the corner of my eye I see something that looks like a person in the mirror directly on my right standing at the end of the hall. I turn to the mirror and it's gone. I look down the hall and there nothing. I let out quite a big gasp as this happened and chuckled at myself. Heading into the room in front of me that leads to an entertainment area. I hear the shuffling again from the hall. Now I'm really standing there listening. The first bedroom's door slams shut. Panicing him going through the whole house trying to find someone messing with me. Nothing comes up. I hear a female voice loudly saying move. This time I heard it. I really just freaking heard that. I start to head to the front door because at this stage my nerves have had it. As I get to the front door, the first room's door that I have opened again slams shut. So now I'm noping it out of the house. I stand outside collecting my nerves to go back in. I say a prayer for myself and go back into the entertainment area. Nothing much happens after that. Just some shuffling and haul as before, but eventually I'm too far to hear it. I finish the inspection and start heading out. Unlocking the front door I hear now, in the same voice. By this point I'm freaking done with this and I just say back, yeah yeah I'm leaving and hightail it out if they're as fast as I could. Later I learned the man staying there had lost his job and wife in the same month. His mother was sickly and in bed most of the time in that first room hence the smell and the stains. I am unsure if she passed away in the house. All I know is he went missing for four months not paying rent and was evicted. The maintenance guy comes comes to me after the work is done and said dude that house is freaky telling me his guys were telling him stories about stuff happening like light switches turning on by themselves and moans and noises. The house if now being rented by the mines for their workers. I haven't heard from them yet. I was a Baltimore Police Department detective. And at the time, in early 2021, I worked directly out of the northern district in the city. On the night in question, I was in my office at home late at night in suburban Howard County, Maryland. I live alone. I often would find myself unable to sleep at night, so I would head to my office to work. That particular night, I was going through a case file that I was working on. Then I heard an unusual noise. It was just different enough from anything I was used to hearing around the house that it caught my attention, not to mention it was around 2 o'clock in the morning. It sounded like something heavy was hitting the ground. It was coming from the yard behind the house. I stood up and I cocked my head to the side to try and pinpoint the exact location. But as I listened closer I realized that it sounded like it might actually be much closer to the house, like right outside the kitchen in the back. I stepped away from my desk and I moved towards my office door. My office was just down the hall from the kitchen, so I opened the door slowly and stepped out to investigate, but first I listened again to be sure I was correct on the direction it was coming from. Sure enough, I heard it again from the area outside the kitchen. I started to make my way down the hallway, and as I got closer the noise got louder. I reached the kitchen and I looked toward the door. The noise had gone silent, almost like whatever was making the noise knew I was listening to it. I slowly and very quietly opened the door to the outside. When I did I was shocked at what I was looking at. Standing on the patio, moving around and making the noise, was a creature, unlike anything I had ever seen before. 
It was about seven feet tall and totally covered in black and reddish brown fur. It had a long snout with teeth protruding at odd angles. The creature turned towards me when the door opened, almost like it instinctively knew I was there. I was totally quiet when I opened the door. The creature quickly focused on me and lunged toward me hissing. I quickly stepped back inside and shut the door. I had to think fast and determine a suitable plan of action. I decided to head back to my office where I hoped to watch it undetected from my office window. I proceeded to look through the window, but it wasn't long before I heard the sounds of the creature breaking into the house through the kitchen door. I pulled out my gun and I aimed it down the hallway. As I slowly opened the office door, I could hear, but not see, the creature in the kitchen. I listened as it was moving around with a lot of force and stepping heavily on the wood floor. I could also hear it snorting as it moved about. It sounded like something out of a horror film. I thought that if I just stayed quiet it might just leave, which would have been the optimal outcome. I listened to it for a while while it moved in the kitchen, but then I heard it go into the dining room. I could hear glass breaking and furniture being shoved around. It seemed to be very angry. I finally opened my office door all the way and stepped out completely into the hallway. I slowly walked towards the dining room with my gun still raised. As soon as I got close I peeked my head around the corner. It turned its head towards me and instantly started to growl. It had an angry look on its face with a human-like expression. I sensed that it wanted to tear me apart right there. But instead of rushing and attacking me, it suddenly went silent again. It quickly rushed back to the kitchen and hurled itself out through the back door. I didn't know what to think at that point. On one hand, I was relieved that it had left, but at the same time, I somehow felt concerned that it may return at some point. I decided then and there that I would find out more about this creature. My confusion and fear turned into anger. I wanted to know who or what this thing was and why it had come into my house. I've done a lot of research, mainly online, but it's been difficult to find anything that really matched what happened. I wondered why it came into the house and what it was looking for. The other descriptions online were generally similar. It was bipedal with pointed ears, large yellow tinged eyes and canine like teeth. It also had a very pungent sulfur-like odor that I can still smell in my memory. My research led to your blog and my contacting you. I have many questions and would like to talk. I still live in the same house, but I currently work for another local law enforcement department. I have not seen the creature since that night, but I instinctively know that it still roams in my area. I wish to remain completely anonymous and discreet about my encounter. My encounter with a Bigfoot happened when I was 11, which was eight years ago. I lived near Childress, Texas. I was out playing in the backyard against the tree line. I was playing with rocks and sticks. Then I noticed trash leading into the woods, so I started to follow it and picked up the trash. Then all of a sudden I heard leaves crunching and I looked around and I saw a deer just standing there. I didn't bother the deer and continued to pick up the trash. As I was doing so, I felt something watching me. At first, I thought it was the deer, but I looked, and it wasn't looking at me, so I kept looking at the deer, and all of a sudden, the deer looked up and stood there not looking at me, but to the left. So I followed its view, and I saw something tall and black standing behind some trees. I didn't know what it was, so I just watched it and the deer. I kept watching them for about a minute, then the deer took off, and once I looked over at the other thing, I saw that it was watching me. I didn't feel like I was in danger, so I picked up the rest and stood up. I looked around for it, but it was gone. I didn't know exactly what I saw, but it felt friendly like it was watching over me while I was picking up the trash. I didn't see it again after that. I still went into the woods to play, hoping it would come back, but it didn't. As I've grown older, I'm sure that this black creature was a Bigfoot. I was underway on a submarine. There were about 125 men on board, but I was standing lookout on the surface, so it was just me and a single officer on the bridge. Normally we would also have a gunner up there, 
but we were in the about as far from any other human as you can physically be on Earth, over one of the deepest parts of the ocean in the middle of the night. Mind you, in the sailbridge of a submarine, you are 20-ish feet above the surface of the water. Well, on one of my visual sweeps, I notice I cannot see the stern light. I tell the officer, because if the stern light is out, you are breaking the law. Then we both realize the entire boat is slowly disappearing below us. It was a large, slow-moving wave crawling up the ship. When we were at the top of the wave, I put my hand down and touched the water. Again, I should have been more than 20 feet above that water. If that wave had been another 10 feet higher, there is a good chance the officer and I would not be alive. Our self-inflating vests would have gone off, and we would have been anchored to the ship by our harnesses. Helpless little boys getting dragged along by the ship in ocean. Then we would have crashed against the hull and masts as the wave passed. We immediately called the captain to secure the bridge because of hazardous conditions, and he approved of this. When we got below decks, we found out that the wave had drained hundreds of thousands of gallons of seawater through the drainage ports in the sail. This was an otherwise calm night. We were often told to be on the lookout for rogue waves, especially then, because two sailors on another submarine had been killed by one a few months earlier. The only rogue wave I ever experienced I could not see coming till it was at my feet. After years of sailing, this was the night I truly realized what a scary place the ocean could be. So back in high school when I lived in my hometown, I used to go stargazing at night by hiking into the hills. One of my favorite points overlooked a large housing tract on the north side of the town, but was relatively secluded with how the hills formed a crest line above these residences. More importantly, this crest line blocked a significant amount of light pollution and allowed for better star viewing. So one night, I took a friend with me up into the hills to go stargazing. She and I were pretty all right friends, but I mostly asked her along because I preferred not to be alone out at night if I could help it. Plus, I was definitely feeling down and needed someone to talk with about how I'd been feeling lately. So while we're stargazing, she and I got to talking and eventually I really broke down and cried. We had probably been up there at least a few hours, so it was really late at this point and we were about a mile up in the hills. So as I'm calming down, my friend gets really quiet. I notice she's staring up into the peaks of the foothills and I follow her gaze. And up behind the peaks, I suddenly notice there's an incredibly dark patch in the sky. Now, to elaborate a little, at this point I wasn't on drugs or drinking or in any way hallucinating. In fact, at the time, I really prided myself on always relying on rational and reasonable explanations for phenomena in the world. But this was something otherworldly. The best I can describe this thing was as a relatively large, dark patch, seemingly spherical in shape, but also with something more angular orbiting its center, as though the orbiting object was turning itself end over end, while the central, gyroscope-like center was flying in a wide arc around the foothill mountain tops. It felt as though it was relatively close, as these foothills are not particularly tall, but was entirely silent. She and I watched the thing fly for a few minutes, whereby it dipped behind some hills and never resurfaced. I will say we definitely saw it weave its way around some peaks, so it wasn't just something tethered and certainly wasn't something floating without direction. The thing had deliberate, slow movement, always turning end over end around that inner sphere circle like object. It wasn't easy to see because of the low light conditions, but the stars and hills provided some backdrop to distinguish the figure from the background. Now, logically, we both agreed that there had to be an explanation. Our hometown features a reserve Air Force base, and it is possible that it was something for meteorological purposes or even something more stealthy from the base. But to this day, she and I have no idea what we saw in those hills. After that object dipped away, we promptly hiked back to our car and drove off. We kept talking about it for the rest of the night, freaking each other out with alien stories about potentially avoiding being abducted, but to this day I maintain it was probably military related. Anyway, that's my UFO story. I have a number of other Hicken camping stories too, 
but this one seemed to be the most creepy. Though there was also the time I was on a three-day hike in the desert, found a knife in some rocks on the first day, and then on the second night had the sky open up or reveal thousands of stars due to natural phenomenon unbeknownst to me at the time. It was mysterious and amazing when I was in the moment of it though. I worked as a park ranger. So one night I received a distress call about a group of hikers who had become trapped in an uncharted section of the deep forest. Determined to find them, I set out on patrol, equipped with my flashlight and a compass. The darkness enveloped the trees, casting eerie shadows that danced with every gust of wind. As I made my way along the trail, my heart pounded in anticipation. The hikers had reported their approximate location, and I focused on following their path. But as I ventured deeper into the forest, a strange feeling washed over me, a feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a figure appeared in the distance. My heart skipped a beat as I strained my eyes to see. As I drew closer, my breath caught in my throat. It was a creature I had never encountered before. It resembled a Sasquatch, but its thick red hair and deep, piercing human-like eyes set it apart. I called out, my voice echoing through the trees, demanding answers. But the creature simply disregarded me and disappeared into the dense woods, leaving me stunned and filled with an inexplicable mixture of awe and confusion. What had I just witnessed? Was it truly a Bigfoot or merely an elaborate prank? Shaking off the encounter, I continued my search for the lost hikers. Their safety was my primary concern and I pushed myself to navigate through the labyrinth of trees and underbrush. The sounds of rustling leaves and distant animal calls intensified my determination. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I stumbled upon the hikers. They were exhausted and frightened but relieved to see me. I quickly reassured them and guided them back towards the safety of the established trails. As I led them out of the wilderness, my mind remained fixated on the creature I had encountered earlier. Once the hikers were safe, I took a moment to reflect. What was the true nature of the creature I had seen? This incident occurred in 2004. I was working as a park ranger at Cuyahoga Valley National Park in North Central Ohio. I knew nothing about Ohio since I had grown up on the West Coast. I had actually volunteered for the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. shift when it was available. I was a night owl at the time. One night around 3 a.m. I got this alert from one of the campsites saying that they couldn't find their friend. That part of that particular campground was out on a small peninsula. There were some coves and curved roads that made it easy to get turned around walking at night. It actually happened a lot. I got there and the friend seemed a little more scared than usual. They said that they had been searching for an hour already, and there was no sign of their friend. They all seemed to be about 18 to 20 years old and smelled of alcohol. I didn't call law enforcement right away because often a drunk person would fall asleep on someone else's chair or picnic table, so we were usually able to find them soon enough. The missing friend had been sleeping in a tent by himself, while the rest were still sitting around the fire. Apparently, he was too tired to stay awake anymore and had gone into his tent to lie down. They said around 2 a.m. they heard him rustling around in his tent. They went over to help him out and to see what was going on. He had walked into the nearby trees to relieve himself, but then he didn't come back out the trees. There shouldn't have been much of an area to get lost in. We all kept calling his cell phone. It rang, but there was no answer. I was concerned about drowning too, so I followed his footsteps in the mud which I was assuming were his. The footprints then stopped abruptly well before the water, still in the trees. I looked around and it didn't seem like he could have jumped anywhere and most of the trees around there were too big to be climbed. The footsteps just ended. They didn't backtrack or anything a little weird. We all kept searching until about 4 a.m. and then called it off. I told them let's just wait until morning. It was most likely that he had fallen asleep out of sight somewhere, so they all went back to their tents to try to get some sleep. I was way too wired to go home so I actually kept at it. 
I was used to staying up all night anyway, and I just wanted to go sit down by the water and stay alert in case I noticed anything. On my way over there, I saw two things dangling down from a tree up ahead, and when I got close enough to see more clearly, I just freaked out. I started backing away. They were feet, but they were not human feet. I just let out this gasp, and then all of a sudden, this thing swooped out of the tree like a bat out of hell. All I could think was that it was some kind of a vulture or something. It was gigantic with probably a 10-foot wingspan, and it had flown down to the water's edge with these huge leathery wings. It was at least as tall as me and I'm six foot in height. It then turned around and it looked at me with these red glowing eyes. All of this happened in a matter of seconds. I realized it wasn't any kind of a bird for sure, and it didn't look like it had a beak. It didn't even look like it had a face. I just saw darkness in these red glowing eyes at that point. I became really concerned about the missing friend. I lost it and I just started yelling at the creature. It turned around and it ran along the shore until I couldn't see it anymore. I was sure we were about to find a dead body, but then I heard this rustling in the bushes and this half-naked person comes crawling out. It was the missing friend. When he was able to make sense, he said that he had gone to the lake to wash himself and the freaky wing thing had scared him half to death. He'd been under the bushes hiding and had passed out by then. I felt like I wasn't even in my right mind anymore. I took the guy back to the campsite, and I eventually got back to my office and checked out. I couldn't take it anymore. I had no clue how to even begin making sense of it all after that. I decided to switch to the day shift, and it ended up being a lot better for me. I eventually left the job at the park in 2008, moved back west, and now work for the state of California. After a stressful day at work, I had gone over to my friend's apartment to shoot the breeze, eat some food and play a few games on my friend's PS4. It was getting late and I had to be up fairly early the next day. My friend walked me out to the parking lot to my car. There was no one else in the parking lot, just us two. As I was unlocking my car, a dog walked out from the side of a nearby building about 25 feet away. It came fully into view and stopped to look at us. It was a little bigger than a standard Great Dane. It was all black with long hair that appeared to be falling out in clumps. It had long ears and a long, scraggly tail. I remember making eye contact with it. It had dark maroon-colored eyes, and in the moment we locked eyes, it smiled at us. But instead of a dog's lips going up and back, the lips went slightly sideways and I saw white human teeth. I recall suddenly getting a feeling of dread and fear. I felt like it was something disguised as a dog and pretending to be a dog. But it wasn't a dog. I'm certain of it. The energy coming off of this thing didn't feel dog-like. I don't know how else to describe it, but my hair went up on end. It turned around from us and began limping slowly back around the corner from where it had stepped out from. It seemed to have most of its weight on its front legs walking with a hunched back. When it was limping away, I noticed its rear left foot was wrapped in blue gauze and the foot looked very odd. The heel was actually parallel to the ground. I am unsure if my friend saw exactly what I saw, but she suddenly said, it's leaving, let's follow it. And she ran after the damn thing right after it disappeared around the corner. I remember being scared for my friend, so I went sprinting after her. I rounded the corner to find my friend looking around confused. The dog thing was gone. At the rate that it was walking and limping, and given the close proximity to us, which again was no more than 25 feet, there was no way that it could have disappeared that quickly. The air was suddenly extremely cold, even for South Texas January. My teeth were chattering, and I told my friend to quickly go back to her apartment, lock the door and stay inside. I warned her that that thing was not a dog and told her I'd text her when I got home. Once safe at home, I texted my friend and thought that was going to be the end of it. But even as I settled into bed, my heart was racing. It didn't help that around 12 a.m., there was low whistling right outside my window. My neighbor's house isn't too far from mine, but they're good people 
and there is no logical reason for them to be that close to my window at night, whistling. I didn't make any indication that I was aware of the whistling. It wasn't even musical, just the sort of whistle someone is giving if they're trying to get attention. Eventually, the whistling stopped and I heard nothing else. I had trouble sleeping. I haven't seen anything or experienced anything like it since. I would like to state that although I do believe people experience alien abductions on a regular basis, I don't think I fall into that category. However, I do suffer from various sleep conditions, such as insomnia and night terrors, and I've had a few experiences that certainly fall into the attempted abduction category, even though I don't believe it's happening to me. But you're welcome to judge for yourself if you like. A few months into a new relationship, I woke up to find a huge seven-foot-tall, at least reptilian being with horns grabbing me by the wrist and trying to pull me out of bed. This is what I saw, as in I was asleep at the time, in the middle of sleep paralysis, very aware that this was happening, but not being able to do anything about it. So I struggled to fight off the thing and break out of the sleep paralysis episode. To my sleeping boyfriend, now husband, he thought I was stirring in my sleep so he moved so I could get up and I punched him full in the face. Of course, once that happened, I snapped out of it and was hugely embarrassed by what had happened, but he was thankfully okay about it. On another occasion, I woke up in my room in the middle of an sleep paralysis episode, unable to move, very aware that there were two greys in my room, one next to my bed, one at the head of my bed. I mentally thought, OMG, there are greys in my room. They began to disappear through the wall and the floor and almost instantly the sleep paralysis lifted. Since that moment I have slept with the TV on or some sort of light source, I'm 36 years old if I happen to be on my own for whatever reason. It seems to stop the episodes strangely enough. I've also experienced missing time. I used to work in a convenience store and the route from my house to the store involved a short walk to the end of my road crossing another road and circling a block of shops. And all around a 10 minute walk if I take it slow. So one morning after a particularly nasty bout of insomnia, I left my house at a quarter to six in the morning for my 6 a.m. start. I walk down my road and begin crossing the other road when my manager calls me on my phone. Where are you? It's 20 past seven. I've had to open on my own. Somehow that little five minute walk to the end of my road had taken me nearly an hour and a half and I have no explanation as to why. There hadn't been a time change due here in England. We go forward back an hour twice a year and even if there had smartphones, etc. Change automatically. I don't recall anything about the morning walk apart from feeling like I was waxing through treacle because I was so tired. I grew up on a street that opened up to a huge canyon or national park that had a train track running through the middle of it. My cousins and I would walk down it all the time when we were younger and explore. It had a very, very minor homeless problem in which men would live down there and walk up through the neighborhoods. Cops were called, and for the most part, it was pretty empty. When I was 13, I decided to walk my dog on my own down in the canyon. We had done it before, and I thought nothing of it. As we get down to the trail, we begin walking, and after five minutes, I get a weird feeling I shouldn't be there. I grab my dog's leash and decide to run up the side of the canyon, which opened up into my neighbor's backyards. I am almost all the way up, sprinting through ice plants when I stop to take a breath and look down. I see two rough-as-shit-looking homeless men walking on the trail I was just on. Now, I don't want to assume anything here, but as a 13-year-old girl still wearing her school uniform, I was flipping terrified. I don't know what told me to leave, but I'm glad I did. Definitely one of the creepiest things I've experienced. The following story may sound somewhat far-fetched given the accused shapeshifter's reputation, but I believe my friend 100%. Basically, a well-known Lakota chief was a shapeshifter and practitioner of black magic. My friend in Rosebud, South Dakota, 
told me that she has seen his legs begin to turn to dog legs during the ceremony where she was a food vendor. She would beat a hasty retreat when she would see this. She is from Oregon and is part of the Klamath tribe. Oddly, out in Oregon, she was adopted by Lakota people and then married a Lakota man. The following story is somewhat sordid and tragic. My friend reported to me that the Lakota chief was getting up in years and had a much younger wife. This wife was so shameless that she would yell out of her tent at powwows and other gatherings, asking who would come and service her because her old man cannot do so. I'm ready to barf just typing that, I'm sorry. Unfortunately and stupidly, my friend's son SB became involved with Lakota chief's wife. This got SB a mark on his head. SB was beaten and left for dead by the Lakota chief's henchmen. A good Samaritan stopped and got him help and he was revived. Later, SB was called because he heard that a res girl was being attacked. That time, SB was killed by the Lakota chief's men who had set him up. They kept moving the body, so it took five years to find it. Nobody in the tribe would talk and there has never been justice for SB. The Lakota chief and his family were a bunch of meth head, black magicians. The chief himself was a shapeshifter and murderer. If you compare the obituary in the Lakota times to that of the rest of the world, you will see exactly what the actual Lakota people thought of him vs. The glamorous image and legacy he left behind. This is a case of bad people sometimes doing the right thing. I thought that I would mention this to you as it is an example of shapeshifting, possibly skinwalker as far north as South Dakota. As to a bundle and pipe given to the Lakota, it was later sold it to two German women several years ago after the holder became drunk. The woman who bought it died soon after. As in the churches, there is a serious illness in the medicine lodge. My Hopi friend recently told me that they have a prophecy that states, our children will kill us. In the next breath, he said that everyone in his village is walking around like zombies with their cell phones. It would appear that the prophecy is being fulfilled right now. This was a heavy note to receive. Our incident took place in January 2017. We had just moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. My wife and I were newlyweds from a small community in the Midwest. Being naive and new to living in the city, I would answer the door without giving it a second thought. Never again. There were several loud knocks at six Susan in the morning, which was unusual, and it should have dawned on me to be cautious. My wife and I had been getting ready for work, a pretty regular routine. The moment I opened the door, I was feeling a strange rush of fear and foreboding. There stood a teenage boy of average height and build with a black leather coat black hair, and sunglasses. The sunglasses at 6 a.m. struck me as odd. Then I noticed he was eating a pear. He simply asked if he could come in and warm up. I said, sorry, but no. I closed the door and slid the security chain into place. A few minutes later, another knock. I opened the now chained door, and before I could speak, he asked again if he could come in and warm up. I replied, no, and attempted to close the door. Before the door could shut, he put his hand out and abruptly stopped the door, as if he had no issue with getting his fingers smashed against the frame. He looked at me, still wearing his sunglasses, and said, Can I at least get something to wipe my hands? I said, Get the hell out of here. My wife is calling the police. He smiles, lowers his glasses, revealing eyes as black and shiny as obsidian, and says, No, you won't be calling anybody. At that moment, I forced the door closed, lock it, and call out to my wife. She was totally freaked out by this time while hiding in the bedroom. I ripped the curtains back to look out the window next to the door. He's gone. Absolutely no trace of him. I go out on the patio and check the gate. It's still latched from the inside. I look up and down the street. Nothing. Then I look down. There is a half-eaten pear lying on the sidewalk. Driving one night, I went down the country road my aunt lived on at the time. She had llamas, and even though they were off to the side, 
and it was nighttime, I could still see them well enough with the glow of the headlights illuminating to the sides. I could see their fur, the colors and patterns. Right then I noticed in front of my car was a very tall, solid black figure, slim with long arms, and its eyes reflected the headlights. If I could see the fur of the llamas without direct light on them, I'd definitely know with this thing right in front of me that it had no texture. Just solid black except those eyes. It walked off the road into the woods. We live outside of Houston, Texas. My wife and I were at home and in our backyard. It was a beautiful cloudy day on 10-21-2021. I first noticed one cloud stop while the rest moved on. I asked my wife to watch it as well. We noticed a swirl in the cloud until it opened. I'm not sure if it was a portal, but it grabbed my attention. Three figures flew out of the opening and then transform into human form. They were light-skinned with long hair with fitted outfits that resembled the villainous characters from Superman 2. They hovered in front of the portal area as if to be checking something. We noticed the windows of the craft, which caused us to also notice the doorway of the ship open. We then observed the other beings in the background of the doorway, as if they were riding on a train or subway. We saw two of the human-like figures go back inside and walk down a stairway into the inside and fade away as they went down the stairs. The remaining figure began to look at us. We felt the intuition of knowing that they were intentionally showing themselves to us for whatever reason. The last figure flew inside the portal and entered the craft's doorway. He touched the open part of the portal and swiped it with his hand and the portal began to close as if automated. The cloud begins to swirl. It then faded away and simply vanished. We remained in the yard and were discussing what we had witnessed. About an hour later, as we were sitting on our patio, a black SUV pulled into our driveway. Two men dressed in all black clothing and sunglasses got out of the SUV and walked toward us. The lead man didn't greet us, but immediately asked if we had reported what we had witnessed in the sky. We were shocked. We responded that we had not reported the event. I then asked them who they were. They didn't answer. They both turned and got back into the SUV and pulled away. That was the last time either of us have seen them. I will mention that the man spoke in a monotone voice that was somewhat high-pitched in tone. Their skin color was weirdly opaque as well. In fact, the two men looked like they could have been twins. I still have no explanation. Do you believe that these were what people refer to as men in black? Something pretty crazy happened to my best friend and I about six years ago. It was the summer after we graduated high school so we were in that transition phase between high school and college. No responsibilities, no worries. We played a shit ton of video games during the day, took spur of the moment road trips to a bunch of places, and often stayed up all hours of the night. Late one particular night, we were driving around in my friend's dad's old Volvo, and we stumbled upon the entrance to a nearby canyon we had never heard of or been to. By this time, it was about three in the morning, but we were curious. So we start heading up the road. We were in high spirits, music loud, cracking jokes in weird accents, the usual. But down the road, we see this sign. It was one of those cement road barriers. There was a number of them parallel to the road, but this one was placed perpendicular and it said, no camping in X Canyon in red spray paint. My friend and I looked at each other. We thought that was a little weird. With most of the nearby canyons, whichever government entity that maintains them has official metal or wood signs erected. But it wasn't anything too out of the ordinary, so we shrugged it off and kept going. At the base of the canyon, it was mostly meadows with low bushes, but further in, it became much more wooded. The scrub oak had grown tall over the road, creating a sort of tunnel. It was beginning to feel a little eerie and claustrophobic, but we weren't the skittish type. We both acknowledged the creep factor of the canyon and kept driving. Then another sign. This time it's plywood nailed to a tree. Said the same thing. No camping. Red spray paint. 
Again, we're thinking, what the hell is with this place? So now we're both fairly sketched out, but we didn't really know why. Yes, the makeshift signs were odd, but maybe whoever maintained the canyon just hadn't gotten the official signs put up yet. Yes, the forest had a spooky vibe, but don't all forests feel like that at night? So again, we kept going. But the further in we went, the less we talked, until we both didn't really say anything. Then it happened. Up ahead, through the scraggly tree branches, we see this light. A campfire. We slow down. My friend asks me what time it is, so I check my watch. 3.45 a.m. You know that, oh shit. Feeling of deep, intense dread. Instantaneously, we both have it. I say we need to turn around, but the canyon road is too narrow, so my friend just starts saying shit over and over as he drives forward. Looking back, I'm not sure why we didn't just floor it driving past the fire, but I think despite the fear, we both had to know what was going on. So we drive up pretty slow, going maybe 10-15 miles per hour. The first thing that came into view was a bunch of cars parked in this clearing, just at the edge of the firelight. Then in the middle of the clearing we see the campfire, and a group of seven eight figures standing around it in a loose circle. They weren't wearing anything strange. They didn't seem to have any weapons. There didn't seem to be anything other than wood burning in the fire. But there were no tents, no camping chairs, and every single one of them were frozen in place, staring at us as we passed. The second we get beyond view, my friend and I lost our marbles. I screamed at him to floor it, so he hit the gas until we came to a turnout just a little down the road where my buddy made a miraculous U-turn. However, I do vaguely remember almost careening off a cliff. At any rate, we came flying back down the road, and again we see the fire coming up quick. Keep in mind, it's only been a minute, maybe a minute and a half, since we first drove past. The clearing came into view, and I shit you not, everyone is gone. The cars are still there. The fire is still there. But every single one of the figures is just straight up gone. We didn't call the police or even really talk about it much after that until, several weeks later, we decided to go back in the daytime just to see what was there. But when we got to the bottom of the canyon, those same cement barriers were now placed across the road, blocking the entrance. The one with red spray paint was conspicuously missing. Posted on one of the barriers was a metal sign that read, X Canyon closed due to ongoing police investigation. It was a crisp morning in June 1980 when my friend and I decided to embark on an adventure to visit our friend's newly constructed lean-to on Snow King Mountain near Jackson, Wyoming. Little did we know that this journey would take an unexpected turn, forever etching an encounter with the unknown in our memories. As we made our way up the mountain, excitement filled the air. We relished the opportunity to explore the wilderness and soak in the beauty of nature. However, our enthusiasm quickly turned to trepidation as we stumbled upon something that defied all logic and reason. There, amidst the towering trees and rugged terrain, we came face to face with a sight that would forever haunt us. A hairy, man-like creature stood before us, its massive frame reaching a staggering twelve feet in height. Long, dark hair cascaded down its hunchback form, with arms extending almost to the ground. Fear gripped us as we stared into the creature's simian-like face, which seemed as large as a stop sign. Its heavy breaths filled the air, accompanied by a haunting, moaning growl that sent shivers down our spines. We knew we had encountered something truly extraordinary, something that defied our understanding of the natural world. Instinctively, we turned and ran, desperate to escape the presence of this mysterious creature. To our dismay, it pursued us relentlessly never relenting in its pursuit. We could hear the creature's eerie sounds reverberating through the trees as we sprinted, hearts pounding in our chests. The chase seemed never-ending, our adrenaline-fueled sprint blurring the boundaries between reality and the surreal. It was as if we had stumbled into a realm of myth and legend, where the lines between human and beast were blurred. Finally, as our strength waned, we reached a streetlight near the Ramada Snow King Inn in Jackson. Gasping for breath, 
we dared to glance back, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature that had pursued us so relentlessly. And there it stood, under the flickering light, a specter in the night, before it vanished into the depths of the surrounding darkness. We staggered back, our minds reeling with disbelief at the surreal encounter we had just experienced. Rushing to the local police, we shared our tale, knowing deep down that few would believe the magnitude of our encounter. The memory of that day still lingers, etched into the fabric of our beings. We were forever changed, forever aware that there are realms beyond our comprehension, where creatures lurk in the shadows, challenging our notions of what is possible. Though the world may scoff at our story, dismissing it as mere imagination or trickery, we know the truth. We cross paths with the unknown, with a creature that defied explanation, leaving us with a profound sense of awe and an everlasting curiosity about the mysteries that lie hidden in the depths of our world. I was driving from Las Vegas to Lake Havasu City in my truck, and it was around 1 a.m. The roads were mostly empty, and the dark nights stretched out ahead of me. After passing through searchlight, I found myself on a stretch of two-lane road, with bushes lining each side, seemingly reaching out towards the asphalt. As I cruised along, the monotony of the road started to take its toll on my senses. The rhythmic hum of the engine provided a comforting backdrop to the quiet desert night. But then, out of nowhere, a peculiar sight caught my attention. There, just before I passed, a large bush bent towards the road at an angle of about 60 degrees. It appeared as if something had forcefully knocked it over, causing it to lean precariously. Confusion and curiosity mingled in my mind. None of the other bushes seemed to be affected by the wind or any other external factors. It was an isolated incident, standing out like a mysterious anomaly in the stillness of the night. I couldn't shake the eerie feeling that something out of the ordinary had just occurred. Uncertainty filled the air as I continued my journey, my foot pressing the accelerator, propelling me forward at a speed of 90 to 100 miles per hour. The road stretched out before me, seemingly endless, and I couldn't help but steal glances in the rearview mirror, half expecting the bush to have righted itself or to witness some other strange occurrence. Eventually, the two-lane road led me to the freeway, where the atmosphere shifted. The sense of isolation gave way to the presence of other vehicles, their headlights piercing through the darkness. I merged onto the freeway, leaving the enigmatic encounter behind me. As I continued my drive, my mind raced with possibilities, trying to make sense of what I had witnessed. Was it a trick of the light, an odd gust of wind, or something entirely inexplicable? The image of that bent bush lingered in my thoughts, like a puzzle piece that refused to fit. My cousin recently moved here from Secunderabad, India. On a recent road trip exploring America, we were shooting shit, exchanging ghost stories, and laughing at sea and differences between American and Indian ghost stories when I asked her if she's ever experienced anything supernatural. Her eyes widened as she averted her eyes to the window. When the silence was about to be too much for me, she softly responded, Yes, a few. One is troubling. In my second year in college, I stayed in an all-girl hostel dorm. I made many friends. We were all delighted to be away from our conservative parents in school. The hostel was so much fun, but it was an ancient building. Electricity was only put in the rooms. Sometimes candles were placed along the windows if a watchman was present, but generally you were faced with complete darkness once you left the chambers. It's common to wake someone if you need to walk down to the restroom at the end of the hall. We all had a childish fear of being alone in the dark. One night, I had to use the restroom. It was about 4 a.m. I went to my friend's bed and tapped her on the arm. She immediately opened her eyes as soon as I touched her. I apologized for bothering her and told her I needed to pee. She smiled at me and hopped out of bed. Down the hallway, she laughed and danced. I could not see her, but her bangles clanked together loudly, and the bells on her anklets jingled softly. It was very calming. I laughed and sashayed my hips down the hallway with her, 
too tired to match elaborate arm movements. She said nothing to me, though occasionally I heard her hum one of our favorite Bollywood songs. The same thing happened on our return. Fell back asleep quickly. One awoke pretty late the following day to the sound of men in our room. They surrounded her bed. I bolted from my bed, prepared to protect my friend, when I realized they were college administrators. I peered over closer. My friend's lifeless eyes were fixated on my bed, the same smile on her fac. Her time of death was 11.30 p.m., almost five hours before I woke her. I drove to a local convenience store here near Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania and Monroe County to pick up something to eat. My dog was with me and it was just before midnight. Everything was normal on the way there, but on the way back something weird happened. As I approach a stop sign outside of town, my dog started growling. My dog rarely growls, so when he does I take notice. I looked around and saw a deer walking toward the road from behind a large oak tree. The deer then stepped out onto the road. It's about 50 feet from me, but then the deer starts to walk toward the headlights of my car. As it gets closer, I begin to see its face much clearer. At first I literally shook my head a bit in disbelief. Then I did a double take. The deer had a freaking human face. There was no elongated nose, no big dark eyes, it was a freaking person's face. The eyes had white surrounding dark blue colored pupils and was forward setting, looking directly at me. I just froze. I don't even remember if my dog was growling at this point. I was truly scared by what I was witnessing. It kept looking at me for almost a minute. Then to turned and slowing walk to the other side of the road, and then walked off into the woods. I stepped on the gas and got the heck out of there. When I got home, I immediately went inside my house and pour a stiff drink. I needed to know what I saw and went online. I stayed up most of the night looking for an explanation for what I had witnessed. I read a few other accounts of what people referred to as not deer, but nothing as dramatic as what I saw. I'm beginning to believe that I witnessed the results of it, an experiment that went wrong. I found your contact email during my research online. Can you give me an answer as to what I saw? The day was Monday, June 26, 2023. I saw a Sasquatch in 23 cross the foothills parkway outside of Maryville, Tennessee. It was huge. The smell it left was a cross of skunk, dead carcass, and swamp mud. It had to be nine feet tall, with shoulders as wide as four feet. Stringy hair, but you could see the muscles underneath flex as it moved. Its thighs were round as a tree trunk. Hardly a neck to it and a cone-type head. Long arms. I would describe it as a half-gorilla and half-Neanderthal man-type animal. I never gave a second thought to a Bigfoot, Sasquatch, or whatever until then. I do not care to see another ever again in person. People are stupid trying to track these animals down. I was off-duty when this happened, but I was also in my uniform still, and in a police car. I was driving to the gym, and I get a call from dispatch saying there was an officer down at the local high school where a kid had been stabbed by another student. This made me drive faster since any school violence is extremely dangerous for anybody involved. Even though I'm off shift, I feel like it's my personal duty to attend. As I'm pulling into the parking lot, which is adjacent to the football field, I see a massive black figure running along the fence line about 15 feet off the ground. I had to do a double take. It looked like two legs, but then there were four. It looked almost human, but too big. Its arms were outstretched, as if trying to climb or something, or just stretch out. It then leapt from one side of the fence to the other effortlessly, which made no sense. It was easily 10 to 15 feet in the air. It then ran over to the top of the car and I have no idea what or who this thing was, but it let out this strange guttural yell that made my skin crawl. I can write all of this up in my report when I get back, but I don't think they'll believe me. I figured I would submit this anyway because it's been too long, and I still remember this thing vividly.
I'm a cop, my own partner, and I park our patrol vehicles at the bottom of a long dirt road that leads to an abandoned school. We only do this on night shift when it starts to get slow around 1 a.m. It's a relatively safe place for us to catch up on paperwork or watch some YouTube. We have had several odd experiences there, from strange lights that maneuver quickly in the woods to possible UFO sightings. We even found a body down there years ago that still has not been identified. But that's not even the most terrifying. This was around October of 2022 p.m. It was a dead night. Crime was low that time of year partly because of sea and partly because it was cold. We had parked our vehicles side by side, facing opposite directions so that the driver's side windows line up. This is common as our line of work. My partner gets dispatched to a noise complaint and leaves. I use this time to step out or relieve my bladder. As I'm standing outside, I hear a whistle in the woods that are across the abandoned school grounds. These woods are roughly 100 yards from where I am parked. The whistle was a tune, like it came from a human mouth, and it was oddly loud. We do have a homeless problem in my city, but not in the area I patrol. But. I assume a homeless person must have wandered their way to the south side of the city. I get back in my car and roll my window up, anxiously awaiting my partner's return. My partner returns after about 20 minutes. I tell him the story and we move on to other topics. I'm a believer in the paranormal, but he is a skeptic. Within about 30 minutes, he decides that he needs to pee. So he steps out and walks to the rear of his patrol car. He's back there for roughly five seconds. And boom, we hear it again. A loud whistle to the tune of a slow song. The whistle lasts for maybe 10 seconds. He walks back to my window and his face is a pale milky white. So as cops do, we decided to investigate. We grab our flashlights and start walking slowly through the field. That grass is up to our waist. We get to about halfway in the field when we hear it again but this time it sounds like it's coming from our right side, where the school is. As we are standing there with our flashlights shining on the school, we begin to see the grass start to move. There is no wind, the grass is not moving around us. It looks like something is crawling in the field. The grass is moving slow in a straight path towards us. We begin walking towards the movement. At this point, we both have our hands on our firearms. The air is eerily still, and you could see our breath from the cold. I can tell that my partner is uneasy. We are walking very slow and quiet. As we get about 20 feet away from the moving grass, it stops, and we hear the whistle. Coming from exactly where our flashlights are shining on the now still grass. Now we are frozen in fear. We are too scared to speak to each other. It feels like minutes pass, but was probably only a few seconds. I go to take a step forward and all of a sudden the grass starts to move again. This time away from us towards the wood line. Only this time it's fast, too fast for us to run after. So we just stand and watch. We watch as the, the moving grass reaches the woods. We both have our lights focused on it. And again the whistle. Coming from the woods where the grass just stopped moving. Only this time the whistle is quiet. This is the part that shocks us. We are now shining our lights into the woods. There are several large trees in our view. This thing stands up. It looked like a child, but not. It's hard to explain. Despite our lights shining directly onto the figure, it seemed amassed in darkness. Before we could even call out, it stepped behind a tree and was gone. We gathered up the courage to go after it. As we get to the tree, there is nothing. No footprints, no leaves crunching like you would expect to hear in autumn. It was like it vanished into nothing. We spent the next hour checking reports for missing children in the area, and we could find nothing. The creepiest part is that it must have been running on all fours when it was in the grass. We have a children's psychiatric hospital in the city, but they had no reports of escapees. To this day, we cannot explain it. And to this day, we continue to park there. Three years have passed and we never had another experience like that. But my partner is now a believer, and everyone at the department thinks we are crazy.
During my ongoing research into the many Bigfoot encounters that have occurred in the Taney County, Missouri area over the years, I posted a request for information on the timeline of a local Facebook group. I was seeking information on Booger place names and received a message from Darla concerning Booger Knob near Rockaway Beach. I saw something a few years ago, but I couldn't really explain what it was and my ex-husband couldn't either. It definitely wasn't any kind of animal either of us had ever seen, but when we stopped and turned around it was gone. Just took it as something we couldn't explain and never really thought too much about it. It was probably about eight feet tall, kind of dark gray with a little brown. Had a mane kind of like a male lion, but shorter hair around the body and legs. Was walking upright on its back legs, but once we got close to our car it got on all fours and took off extremely fast. We slowed down, stopped to turn around immediately, and drove back and forth a few times, trying to see what it was, but it was completely gone or hiding. Never saw it again. I'm not saying what I saw was Bigfoot, but I know I'm not crazy. My ex and I both saw something neither of us had ever seen before in our lives. I can't explain it. I spent a lot of time in the woods, and that was definitely a first. I was working on a pot farm in the Trinity Pines, which is like the size of a subdivision and the properties are divided up like that too. So there's one thousands of one two acre pot farms right next to each other. The pines are notorious for people disappearing, large grow operations and crime in general. A friend and I were headed into town to get pizza and supplies for the roughly 20 people we were working on the hill with. It's about a 30-45 minute trip down dirt roads through the hauler to a highway that leads into town, but it's only about 12-15 miles away. It was early evening late afternoon. About 20 minutes into our trip, right before we're off the mountain, this girl comes running out of the trees flagging us down. We stop and let her into car thinking she's another trimmer who just wants a ride into town. I immediately notice she looks frantic, so I ask her if she is all right, and she responds in French and very broken English. From what I could gather, she had escaped from a trim job. They had her shackled or handcuffed to a workspace, and she ran for it when they let her off to piss. Apparently, she ran straight down the mountain and straight into us. She said the people who took her captive were Nazis, and they had guns. We ended up dropping her off at the police station in town. This is a strange one. A little over a year ago, back in 2018 in the Grand Teton National Park, I had an encounter with a creature that I simply cannot identify. I have searched and scoured online and have not found anything that resembles the being that I saw. I try not to speak of this often, as I fear I will be thought of as a loon. During the summer of 2018, I was working for the National Park Service in the Grand Teton National Park specifically in the Inner Lakes District. This was my first year in the position, and I was assigned to work at a campground on Blacktail Butt, just outside the main park. I was busy closing the campground, with two other co-workers alongside me. As I was counting the money from the evening before, I heard a very distinct but strange, unmistakable howl coming from the west of the campground. The sound seemed to be coming from the base of the mountain. The campground was located at the base of Blacktail Butt, a small mountain just on the outskirts of the park. From my location, I could see that the sound was coming from the direction of the mountain. There were three other campgrounds located near the mountain, so I could observe all the other campers and employees in the area. For the most part, there were no campers with their dogs in their campsites, so that possibility was checked off. Nor were there any visible dogs in the area. I was trying to determine what this howl was, or if maybe there was a wolf. But the howl was unlike that of a coyote or a wolf. It was very different, difficult to describe. It was similar to the recording of Bigfoot calls that you can hear online. Off the top of my head, I want to say there are the Ohio calls you can look up. I'm sure it's on YouTube, as is everything nowadays. I continued to listen, and as I did, all the other rangers in the area seemed to listen as well. I began asking my co-workers if they had heard the sound, 
but apparently nobody had heard it from their location. I felt silly, so I kept my mouth shut. After a few moments, I heard another howl, similar but not exactly the same, coming from the same location. I have never heard a coyote or a wolf make a sound like this. It's hard to describe, really. It was then that I realized that none of the other rangers were acknowledging the sounds. They acted strange, nervous, and quick-eyed. It felt as though they had heard it, but were choosing not to say anything. What did they know that I did not? Just as I was almost ready to pack up and leave, I heard a co-worker on the radio. He was calling for a minute. As I was leaving, I could see a person walking in the area of the howls. They were staying in the tree line, but moving steadily up the mountain. I got closer and asked my co-worker if he had seen anybody in the area. He told me that he, too, had been walking around and patrolling the area. I informed him of the sounds I had heard. I wasn't sure what they were, but they were coming from the back part of the campground. He got nervous almost instantly, the second I brought it up. He got close to me and whispered in my ear that he's pretty sure he saw a tall, dark figure moving around on the back section of the park. He said he didn't get a good look at them and claimed he did not want to. He felt an immediate sense of danger and fear. As he spoke to me, I could tell from his voice and body language that he was genuinely concerned. I drove a little bit further, trying to see what it was that he saw. He had told me it was on the back section of the park, and that's exactly where I went. After a while, I'm pretty sure I saw what he saw because what I saw was approximately seven feet tall and had the same dark color. I tried to get a better look at it, but I could tell it was right near the edge of the tree line. It had already moved into the tree line, coming from a large meadow. I even told my other rangers about it, but they would not speak to me about it. In fact, one told me to stop talking about it if I knew what was good for me. This particular ranger has not spoken to me since and refuses to. After I saw this thing enter the tree line, I decided not to follow it. Another thing to keep in mind is that it was pouring down rain during this time, and even then, the ground was hard. There should have been tracks. I went back later to look, but I did not find any, especially in the wet portion of the grass where I saw this thing enter the tree line. It was very strange how I did not find any tracks at all, be it boot prints or animal tracks. After returning to the office, I kept hearing the howls again, almost all night. This time, there were multiples, one coming from the north end of the campground and the other from the east. My belief is that there were two of these creatures communicating back and forth with each other. So now, if I ever hear or experience anything strange, I don't really talk about it with my colleagues. For whatever reason, they seem hell-bent on keeping everything a big secret or conspiracy. I'm not really sure why, but they refuse to talk about it. Perhaps the refusal to acknowledge the existence of these creatures helps them cope with day-to-day -day life. But for me, I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. Lastly, I would like to assure you that what I saw was simply not a person. Nor was it a person in a costume, because what I saw could not be explained as such. The proportions were so often distorted that it would not make sense. The movement alone was different. I also apologize in advance for not having the most descriptive story and account, but you get what you get. Thank you greatly for taking the time to listen to my story. This incident took place when I was in about sixth grade. I'm from Ohio, closer to Kentucky, and we lived in a rural area very far away from people. Our only neighbors were the two houses on the sides of us we lived in the middle house. I was really bored one day and decided to walk through the cow pasture behind my house and into the woods. I began walking and hopped the fence leading into the woods, just exploring for a good hour or so. I didn't stray far, but far enough that I couldn't see my house. As I walked, I got the sense of being watched. That's when I noticed an extremely large buck, bigger than what I'm used to seeing. The antlers were wider than its actual body and seemed sharper than they should have been. It was standing about 20 or so feet away, kind of hidden in the tree line. It was standing at an angle, and it seemed freakishly tall for a deer. The back legs were bent weirdly, 
and I couldn't see the front hooves. I thought it might be territorial, so I started to back away slowly, not making eye contact. Eventually, I moved out of its line of sight and started heading home. I remember it following me, but still at a distance. There was a noticeable rotting smell, which seemed stronger the closer I got to the deer. As I made my way out of the forest and into the cow pasture, I looked back, and it was standing on the edge of the forest line. It seemed weird, but I shrugged it off. Later that night, around 2-4 a.m., I heard banging outside my window. My window was about 10-ish feet off the ground and faced the back of the house towards the cow pasture. I sat up in my bed, which was pressed up against the window, and peeked out. To my horror, I saw the deer scratching and tapping its antlers against the wall of the house. I tried to shoo it away by making noise, but this caused it to look up and stare at me with its piercing, empty eye sockets. Then it slammed its head harder into the wall before standing up on its back legs and stretching. It began pounding and clawing at the wall, slamming into my window, causing the glass to crack. I let out a blood-curdling scream, which seemed to anger it. My stepdad came running into my room, ready to scream at me, but then he saw the deer trying to climb its way into my window. It was letting out grunts as it clawed at the wall, and its antlers broke through the glass. I fell out of my bed as my stepdad ran to grab his shotgun, firing off rounds into the creature's head. As he did this, the creature wailed like a human, almost letting out angry screams, before falling back out of the window and crashing to the grass. My stepdad kept firing at it as it continued to wail, before it ran back into the woods in a manner resembling that of a human. Months after this incident, I was living with my grandparents when we received a call that my stepdad had died in an ATV accident that day. What they failed to mention was the fact that the ATV wasn't what killed him. When he initially crashed, he was paralyzed and unable to move, but he was still alive. What happened next was gruesome, he was eaten alive. Half his face, chest muscles, and arm were gone, and they assumed it was wild animals. But the only tracks they found were deer hoof prints. To this day, I don't know what it was. I was told to never talk about it, but now that I live in a city, I wanted answers. So, what do you think? I am a 20-year veteran in the Force Service. I've worked as a ranger now for 12 years. My time and in all my time working for the government, I've never encountered anything out of the ordinary. That is until my last station job as a ranger at Gooseberry Falls State Park in Minnesota. It was quite possibly one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had while on duty and certainly not something I'll ever forget. Well, to explain how it happened, we need to go back about six months before that incident. I had been planning on retiring. My son had just graduated college and was looking to move closer to Minneapolis. So once he made the offer that he would work part-time with me while he looked for a full-time position, I decided to pass up retirement and stay on the job. By the way, I should make a note that this was all pre-covered. I had heard rumors of management positions opening up in the area. So after discussing it with him, we both agreed that he would come back home for around six months while I waited for the opportunity to present itself. I was first introduced to Gooseberry Falls State Park during my orientation as a ranger there, and they took us out into the park at nighttime. It was an amazing sight getting to see all these bright campfires down below from way above on top of the waterfalls. The rocks around the falls are very smooth and slippery due to years and years of erosion. You have to be careful if you want to climb down to view the falls at night. Our group had just finished our tour and was going to head back towards our cars when one of my co-workers, Tom, suggested that we climb down the falls, just you know, for the sake of it. I agreed, and we should have known better, and so did a handful of others who were nearby. As soon as we began climbing down, I sensed something wasn't right, but being fearless, I pushed those feelings aside as nothing more than nerves. It started out easy, everyone traveling downward in a single file behind each other, staying close and yet far enough apart for safety's sake. Then, around three quarters of the way down, things began to get a bit more dangerous. Tom fell. I didn't see him do it, but I heard the commotion. One of my other co-workers had seen what had happened, yelling up to us that he needed help getting Tom back up the rocks. Two guys rushed down to assist in whatever way they could, 
and while Tom was being helped back up, one of my female friends called out for help above him, saying she was slipping. It turns out that one part of the path she had been on had been walking, had gave way underneath and sent her tumbling downward. While this may have been scary in and of itself, what happened next could only be described as something straight from a horror movie. We're all standing there in shock at what had just happened when I heard the sound of movement. I looked up, and there at the top of the ridge was this figure with long dark hair watching me. It was terrifying. It was in all black and had these faint yellow glowing eyes. It was in that moment that I felt my entire body give way as if I suddenly lost control. The next thing I knew, I too was falling down to the grounds below me. Everybody rushed over to help save me, and one guy managed to grab hold of my hand, while another wrapped his arms around one leg for whatever little good that did. They tried pulling me back up, but there was no use. I looked down below, and I could see there were people trying to help my friend, though they weren't having much success. I knew then that we were all going to die right here on these rocks if somebody didn't do something fast. That's why I remember the park ranger telling us about one of the waterfalls in this area called Lucifer Falls, which for some reason, nobody had ever been able to find after climbing down to view it at night. It was said that once you get close enough, you could hear voices, supposedly spirits, whispering your name from below. Now, what is most troubling about this story is not so much what happened to me and my co-workers, but what happened with Tom and the female friend. As they were being pulled back up to safety, before either of them can make it out of the water completely, we noticed that their eyes had turned from their normal state into a solid black. It was like at this moment that my two co-workers realized that they were struggling with weren't actually Tom or the girl. I'll never forget hearing one of them scream as he pointed downwards towards whatever our friends had become. The other one, just before Tom and his girlfriend can pull themselves completely up onto the rocks, let go with both hands, jumping back down into the water below to avoid capture. We watched him swim off in the opposite direction, but by this time, there was nothing we could do to save him. We never did find out what happened to any of them after that day. I can only assume they were captured and are now being used as some sort of test subjects for whatever their reasons may be. Just looking at my own hands now, I can still see the long dark hair growing on them, like I saw that day. That's why I'm warning you all not to venture down this path at night. As a matter of fact, it might be best just to stay away from these woods entirely during nighttime hours like we should have. Whatever it is that inhabits these lands does not seem too keen on having people wandering around here at night. But if you are, be careful, for you may soon find the woods themselves can't tell the difference between friend and foe. While in the middle of the Atlantic, my ship in 1999 was followed by a ball of light. I was on the Snoopy team and rushed out to see this ball of light that at first we thought was the rare ball lightning. But this thing followed the ship for about eight nautical miles. It then flew up supersonic, not breaking the sound barrier. We lost sight of it till it just appeared on the port side and came across the flight deck. The captain was about to call general quarters, but it was almost like it sensed that we were getting nervous and it left. Shortly after we picked up some chatter from a Portuguese fishing ship that said a large firefly was bothering them. That was it on that occasion. We have always seen things flying above us, but they were not close enough to have any credible witness. We are treasure divers from Key West, and we were out fishing late night or early morning. Everyone that has spent time on the water knows the witching hour on the sea is about 2 a.m. to 5.30. It was about 5 a.m., and with the sun coming up and the water gin clear, we could see our chumming was bringing some interesting critters to the surface. Some big sharks cruised by, and different things too, but suddenly one of the guys screamed out. Look at the size of this manta ray on the port side. At the same time, another guy said, Wait, I can see him on starboard side too, and he is wider than the boat. He was too, over 18, 20 feet wide, and he lazily cruised under us and circled back again and again. The sea has many secrets, and she hasn't given up many of them despite what people and scientists claim. We know more about the moon than we do the deepest oceans and our seas. Recently, a friend told me she met people in the Southwest that claim extraterrestrials live in the deep ocean and have been there for a long time. They claim they're safe there because humans can't live and survive in the deepest oceans. My friend's brother works as firefighter in Korea, but he used to work as diving instructor. 
Near end of his college years, one of the jobs he took was diver, as in someone who dives to retrieve the bodies of drowned people. While he didn't get a lot of cases, I remember him telling me this one story about his experience. On this particular day, he was diving in a river after it flooded due to typhoon. They had report of a drowned person, and they were searching for the body. After an hour of searching, his colleague informed that he found a body, and few divers went to retrieve it. The water was murky, but you could still make out figures in the water. When the divers were close to retrieving the body, the search party leader told everyone to surface. Back on the ship, he explained that this body shouldn't be touched because unlike normal bodies that float on water, this one was standing in middle of water. Apparently, in Asian cultures, grim reapers can't cross over water, so people who drown must replace their spot with another person in order to pass on to afterlife. And the standing corpses are the ones that are looking for people to replace their spots. Also, these spots with standing corpses are more likely to have underwater whirlpools or currents that can trap people easily. They marked the spot and checked it every day, and retrieved the body after three days when it floated on top of the water. When I was in my early teens, I visited my dad in Pennsylvania. He had just gotten remarried and had another child, my baby sister. Anyway, I fell asleep at my new grandmother's house downstairs. This is a three-story house with a basement and an attic five floors, and I had no clue where anyone else was. I woke up downstairs on the couch around midnight in utter terror and could not explain why. I felt as if something in the shadows was watching me and I needed to get away. I ran upstairs and got into bed with my dad who never woke up. Moments pass and I feel something on my legs. I wanted to look but couldn't look. I must have been paralyzed. It seems like hours passed as I slowly somehow began to work my head to the side and saw one of them peeking over my father with its hands over his mouth. I received a telepathic message of some kind that he shouldn't be smoking and that something bad might happen to him because of it. I don't know if it was a threat and these are childhood memories so it's very difficult to specifically put into words. If I had to describe these little creatures they would be like salacious crumb from Star Wars, very goblin-like, very skinny with big ears. There was a bigger one standing at the foot of the bed. I was fighting this paralysis the entire time and I think it's this ability to fight their paralysis that made them interested in me in the first place. Anyway, I see the big one who seems to have an oval-shaped flat and purple-like head with a dark cape. The body never moves, but the head can swivel 360 like an owl or something. At first, the being was extremely interested in the books on the shelf. Paperbacks and hardbacks. Novels. For whatever reason, it was checking all these books out. There were two identical ones, one bigger than the other though marching in place in the corner of the room. They were glowing white and looked to be very furry or luminous. Big bushy circular bodies with spindly skinny appendages. A big one and a little one both glowing, both marching in place in the corner of the room, not looking at anyone. This seems to go on forever. At some point, they migrated to the next room where my little sister was sleeping in her crib. At that point, I felt strength. I felt anger. That's what it was. You are not going to touch my sister and I shut off the paralysis and jumped out of bed. As soon as I did that, the two beings marching in the corner went down to the floor and the light began to change in the room. I saw them march downward through the floor and then I ran into the next room. The rest looked at me and floated quickly toward the stairwell as the light from 8 a.m. in the morning brightly lit the entire house and they went down the staircase and turned into indistinguishable vapor in the morning light. Believe me when I say I was in pitch black for an endless timeless state, and then it was immediately eight hours afterward. That was my first experience. It gets weirder. So after that, I went back home to Mississippi with my mom and began having nightly experiences for the next eight or nine years. I'm not going to go into those details because they were terrifying and I don't want to think about them. But eventually, I felt that the danger must be coming from the window in my room. I didn't like my room anymore. And I had witnessed too many weird things around my window late at night. So I rearranged my room and blocked up the window by putting my bed right beside it. You'd think that this wouldn't be the right move, but it made me feel safe for whatever reason. The night I did this is the one I will never ever forget for as long as I live, and I get chills just thinking about it. I woke to the back door being kicked open, and immediately I knew that our house was being robbed. I tried to stay as still as possible in my bed with my eyes just barely cracks of lashes to be able to see what was going on, but still pretend that I was sleeping. 
I hear a commotion in the hallway outside my room. Thinking about it now, it could not have been adult people. These were either a whole bunch of small creatures or not actually physical disturbances. It was a commotion, a torrent of motion through the hallway. And then my bedroom door slowly crept open. Standing in the doorway was a bright ball of light. When I was a child, I figured it must be a flashlight, but my memory does not agree with that. As an adult, it doesn't make sense to me. It was simply a ball of light, and it moved on. I heard commotion throughout the house. I heard a struggle. I heard fighting and my family being in pain. I was too afraid to move. I wasn't exactly paralyzed. I felt like they were maybe testing me. Finally, I hear my mother calling my name and pain dragging herself across the carpet. I will never forget this for the rest of my life. I was too afraid to move to help my mother. But strangely, the sound of her pulling herself across the carpet never advanced. It stayed right outside my door. I felt like they wanted to lure me somehow and I didn't understand intellectually, but instinctively I knew I should stay put. This dragging noise went on for a timeless state yet again. Then, like a switch of up light bulb, it was morning and I hadn't even closed my eyes. So I ran to the phone and dialed 911, but hung up immediately. My brother was asleep in his room. My mom was asleep in her room. I woke her up and asked her what happened last night. She said your brother had an asthma attack and we left you here at home alone at midnight. So I got all into energy work and kundalini yoga and became a Reiki master and attempted to understand what the spiritual energy was that I have that allows me to fight their paralysis when I become angry and impassioned at them. This spiritual force that fights them was my main goal in life at that point. I needed them to stop and it worked for a long time. I have many more stories about this intermediate period where I kept them at bay from terrorizing me, but began to have truly interesting and enlightening experiences with the UFO phenomenon. It led me to believe that there may be some good ones and some bad ones. Either that, or they don't all come from outer space. So maybe goblins coming from an extra-dimensional realm beneath us. No idea really, I'm just relating what happened. The story goes on, even up until the present day. Would you believe me if I said I have trouble keeping ordinary jobs? I have a difficult time relating to normal people. I'm always far out and crazy, and nobody understands. I wonder why. Is it possible that I may be one of them? I am a reasonably social person. Four years ago, I was living in Pittsburgh and decided to bike to DC about 350 kilometers there is a trail that goes and is fairly fast from civilization, especially in the West Virginia, Maryland stretch. It's a known route a lot of people do often. However, normally you'd go in a group and do it in four or six days. I went alone and was done in three. This meant leaving before sunrise and finishing after sunset every day, pedaling to no end and having no one to talk to. By the end of day two, I started hearing voices, not random amorphous voices you normally have in your head. Voices belonging to specific people in my life. They were saying things consistent with those people's personalities, and we had long conversations about a whole host of things. Most interestingly, I was aware that this was all happening in my head the entire time, but had no way to turn it off. It all went away once I had a good night's sleep and a real meal, but it was a very interesting experience. I imagine this is what schizophrenia feels like, minus the awareness that the voices are not real. It was a wild night, one that I'll never forget. The date was September 1, 2020. I live in Naperville, Illinois. I was headed back home on a public bus. I believe it was a pace, and I was pretty much alone. Just me and the bus driver and one or two other people. That in and of itself was strange, but I'm not sure that was related. Anyways, I board the bus, and the bus driver is stopping off at plenty of locations. We arrive at one where there's little to no light around it. No street lamps, no houses or buildings, no nothing. The only thing illuminating the scene was the dim light inside the bus and the headlights. The bus driver opened the doors and nobody budges. But as the bus driver began to close the doors, we heard these really heavy footsteps come out of nowhere. Then I heard the most god-awful sound I have ever heard. It wasn't quite screaming, it wasn't singing, but it sounded angry. The bus driver began to open the doors again for the thing to the board. But as soon as it came into eyesight, nobody wanted that, that thing, to board this bus. The driver shut the doors as quickly as he could, and this creature became infuriated. 
It was wearing women's clothing, an orange shirt, and an orange hat with some shorts. It had been hot here. But that thing was not like any woman I've ever seen. I don't even know how to describe it. It could have the power to shapeshift if that's a thing. This thing, it was a she, or at least wanted to appear so, began pounding on the bus doors, howling its angry, screaming song. It went on for a long time. The bus driver was clearly in shock and confused and downright scared, as he should be. Hell, I was scared too. I don't think any of us knew what to do. And at the same time, we weren't sure if this thing would follow us. If we did let the creature in, would it harm us? Kill us even? Would it chase after us if we didn't? If we called the police and it left, would they even believe us? It wasn't any kind of cryptid like Bigfoot or the Chupacabra. Was it an extraterrestrial life form? It is an experience I will not forget ever in my life. The first thing I did when I arrived home was look up anything similar to no avail. So after these three years, I decided to report it. I know that you have been involved with the Chicago Mothman sightings investigation, but is it possible that this thing is related? It happened again late one night in September 2018. I live in Northeast Pennsylvania. I've been an experiencer for most of my life. They made no attempt to show up quietly either. There was an electrical storm and I've seen craft hanging around those. So when one of these storms with no rain was hanging out directly over the house for a while, I knew they were coming. They took out the lights first and I tried not to be scared. I'm tired of being scared so I asked how to make the fear go away. I tried to go about my evening routine. Then there was some sort of hissing at the front door. Was I imagining it? No, that is definitely for me. So I got mad. You have to honor free will. You can't take me against my will, I repeated many times. Now though, I think this was my opportunity to cooperate had I let them in. I wish I had the courage to do this so I could learn what they're doing. The hissing stopped when I refused to open the door. Storm got angrier, so I went to bed. I kept repeating variations of the free will thing for a while, not happy that they clearly had other plans. Then I called my sister to attempt to wait them out, talked with her for a while, then tried to go to sleep since by now the power was back. I told them I need my alarm for work, thought they might move on, still wide awake, but I can't sleep. My cat starts weirdly slinking off the bed like he's stalking something in the corner of the room, but very slowly, so I sit up to see what he's watching. The blue light from one of their freaking wands blinks off. I could see it under the door when I sat up. The cat calmed down and returned to his spot. Apparently, they don't just control us in our sleep. I called my sister again. Now I'm really upset. She tells me to come over. It's too late, even if I wanted to. They are determined. So I resign myself to my fate and go to sleep. I have to get up in four hours by now. They must be trying to take my soul again like they did the only other time I remember seeing the stick with the blue diode at the end because I had a brief out-of-body experience. The last time I saw it, one of the few times I remember anything at all, they were trying to teach us how to leave our bodies. But by teach, I mean they rip you out forcefully to get you used to the feeling. Empathy is not a thing the gray being have, I guess. But I don't think it's them. I think what runs the show are the reptilians. I sat up in bed from sudden pain, it shocked me awake. But then the pain from my arm falling asleep in my body pulled at my soul, and my actual body sat up to absorb the soul. I watched myself sit up into myself, kind of cool. Then they knocked me out I guess because I was out immediately afterward. I had personal enlightenment recently, where I felt the fire of the chakra alignment send this new energy up my spine. It's a more intense ability to connect to the universe I haven't had before. I can literally feel it now when I tap in to talk to the universe. It's like tingles up my vertebrae. I have a very strong feeling their sudden intensity was because of this. They've never been so obvious before. Clearly, I needed to be studied immediately. But they don't want the body. They only want the soul. Them and that damn stick. I think I might have a soul contract with them I need to figure out how to get out of. I had a hypnotic regression done a few weeks after that incident. It was very disappointing because my questions were not answered. The encounters have been less severe since then. I'm just hoping that it eventually stops. My father and I were in Dulce, New Mexico. I've lived in New Mexico since 2000, but have never been to this town, despite it having quite the history in cattle mutilations, etc. 
As we were inside the grocery store, there were two very strange-looking teens wandering around, almost like brother and sister. The younger boy was about 11 and had his hair slicked like alfalfa from the little rascals, and the teen girl was wearing dark black sunglasses indoors the whole time. Upon leaving the store, another family was coming in a white, engineering-type nerdy government lab-looking type with a Native American woman, along with their four children. There was a baby in the basket covered with a blanket, a two-year-old, and what looked like four- and seven-year-old girls. The combination of the nerdy engineering-type white guy with his native-looking wife in such an insular community seemed strange to me for this area. Then there were the children, whose skin was much, much darker than that of what I assumed to be their Native American mother. The two girls stopped short of me as I was coming out of the grocery store entrance. The way they looked at me almost animal-like in curiosity, with silent gazes and their heads cocked inquisitively, almost like a curious puppy dog, with what seemed to be extremely dark black, very reflective, glistening eyes. Three experiences at the same place. About two hours from Phoenix, there's a petroglyph mound. It's well documented and all that, no secret, in a very cool place. One day I rented a fun car and went for a drive through the desert. I saw the landmark sign for the site from the highway and decided to go take a look. Nothing particularly weird happened, although there was definitely an energy feel about the place. I don't know how else to describe the experience other than to say the place had energy and you could perceive it. Now at the time I carried two cell phones, one for work and one personal. I was taking pictures with each and texting them to people, and I happened to notice that with the Verizon phone, as I got closer I got to the mound, my signal would fade. Right up next to the rocks, no signal. Fifty yards away, full signal. The at and t phone wasn't affected at all. In addition to the energy feeling, I had the sense that I was trespassing, but because I was being quiet and respectful, my presence was being tolerated. After a while, I knew it was time to leave. Nobody else was there the whole time I was, but as I was driving out, somebody else passed me on the way in. It felt like the place didn't want more than one person there at a time. Second time I went, I took my parents when they were in town visiting. There were a bunch of other people there too walking around. The energy feel wasn't there, like it was hiding with so many people in the area. Fast forward several years, and there's a meteor shower supposed to happen this particular night. My girlfriend and I both wanted to see it, and I knew from being out there during the daytime that it would be truly pitch dark black at night, and that there was a good parking lot to set up some chairs and watch the meteorites. So we do that, and we'd been chilling for about five minutes when we both get that, somebody is watching me, feeling very intensely, and at the same time. We both shined our flashlights around in a circle a few times and didn't see anybody. We figured that we were just spooking ourselves out and sat back down for a few minutes, but the feeling got way stronger, like this amped up electric danger, get out now, instinctual fear feeling. We threw our chairs in the car and unasked that place as quickly as we could. Once we got back to the main road, we were asking each other, did you feel that too or am I just being crazy? Questions and we both had the same exact feeling. So it's completely possible that we were just being weenies and scared each other. It's also possible that I was projecting some kind of respect the sacred Indian land feeling onto the place from my first experience, but in my heart, I don't think so. Either something didn't want us there that night or somebody was about to hurt us, and we were being warned to leave before that happened. I just got goosebumps on my arms and legs from thinking about it. At the end, my hypothesis was that there is something unique or powerful about that site, and whatever that has also caused the Indians to choose it for their purposes. I and my wife used to travel to New Hampshire from Massachusetts to buy cigarettes once a month. Anyway, on this day we decided to drive from the cigarette store to Brattleboro, Vermont along this long winding route that went through some woodsy areas. We were about halfway along this route when we crested the top of a hill and I had to take a leak. It just so happened there was a pull-off area just under some high tension power lines and what looked like a dirt access road for service trucks for the lines. I didn't pull into the road but did park in the pull-off. I walked about 40 feet or so into the woods to not be seen by anyone passing on the main road and started to do my business. Then, all of a sudden, I heard something falling from or tearing through the tree branches. It startled the heck out of me. My first thought was a maybe a rotted limb had broke loose and was falling from one of the tall trees. Then I heard the thump. 
I was horrified to see a boulder about the size of a basketball slam into the ground about 10 feet from me. My first thought was maybe I was trespassing and someone was trying to scare me off. I yelled, hey, knock it off with the rocks. No sooner did I get that out of my mouth when I heard the branches sound again from the same direction, and this time I could see the branches waving and bending as another boulder was heading my way. I zipped up and beat feet back to my car as I had my two-year-old son and wife in the car with the top down. I quickly got in and tore out of there as my first thought was for the safety of them as well as myself. My wife was asking what was all that noise and who were you yelling at? All I could reply was that some jerk was throwing rocks at me. That's when it all really hit me these weren't your normal sized rocks that anybody could just throw. Not to mention that they were tearing through the tops of 50 to 80 foot maple and oak trees from a long way off. When this reality hit me I felt dizzy and dazed as to the danger I was truly in and who or what could do that. I got to tell you I spent years pondering and replaying that in my head, never coming up with a logical reason. I even went back to the place years later to see if maybe there was a hill or ledge where those boulders could have fallen. But nope, nothing nor any property or dwellings anywhere near, just those power lines with the rutted road beneath them. It wasn't until I was watching TV in 2015 while I was laid up with shingles and the continuous YouTube that I saw some guys in Canada had a similar thing happen while fishing on a lake. The only difference is they saw what was hurling the boulders, an 11 to 12 foot hairy creature. So I do believe I had a Bigfoot experience. I got a very unbelievable story to tell you. I don't know if you're familiar with the Skinwalker Ranch over here in Utah. I have a close relative that is pretty much the UFO guy in that area. He's been telling me these stories ever since I was a little kid. I've been out to that ranch several times and I was out there in the spring 2013 and nothing happened. We went around the ranch areas and nothing happened. We went home and on a Saturday night, something did happen, which I later found out through my UFO relative. There were some Ute native kids driving in a tall truck about eight feet high and they went up to the gate of this UFO ranch. They said that they saw an orb of light appearing in the window off or above the gate and I guess they turned on their lights or they turned on their engine because they got scared. Then it had an even brighter light and it went over their truck and these kids. Well, something hit their truck. These kids got scared so they went down the road to the main road and they got out which is, I'm guessing, about three quarters of a mile. They got out to look at the damage done to this truck and for some reason the driver decided to be the passenger and then the passenger was the driver. Apparently, there are some girls with them in this truck. Well, once they got back in the truck, this is where it gets very unbelievable. A creature grabbed this kid, who was the driver and now the passenger, and pulled him out of the truck. It threw him around like a rag doll, bit him on the butt several times and clawed him. Long story short, somehow this kid got back in the truck and one of the kids took a picture of this creature, no image provided. They got scared. They were able to get back in their truck, drove down the road, and talk to the Ute Indian police because it's a Ute reservation over there. The Ute Indian police say there's nothing we can do about it because they're very well aware of the Skinwalker Ranch. So the next day, which would be Sunday, they contacted my UFO relative, and he went down there to investigate. Meanwhile, there was a shaman's wife and the shaman was there blessing the kids that were involved in this. My UFO relative said that he saw the picture on his cell phone of this creature. He also saw the damage done to the truck. There was also a scratch into the truck die, and he also saw the damage done to this kid and the bite marks. Now that was very unbelievable for me to hear. The crazy thing about it is, a few months ago, I work at a hospital, and one of my patients was actually the shaman's wife. She was the one that was also there at that time when my relative was there to investigate. She told me exactly what my relative said, but in greater detail. The creature that she described, and also my relative said, had to be a tall creature because he would hold this kid out of this window. That's the eight foot tall truck and this creature had horns. It had red hair. It had a human like face, but the mouth was distorted and it came out kind of like a wolf. It had claws and it had wings. So my question is to you, and I asked my UFO relative, is this the skinwalker? And he goes, no, this is something totally different. And I asked also the shaman's wife and she agreed that it was something totally different. I've had a few paranormal experiences throughout my life, but the strangest and most unbelievable was what I know I used to see as a teenager. A gnome, 
It wouldn't have even been as tall as my knee, probably halfway up my shin. It had a red hat and a white beard. He was a typical garden gnome, only he wasn't a statue. I saw him at least a dozen times through our living room window, frolicking about in the garden and along the windowsill outside. I'd sometimes even see his silhouette through the blinds if they were closed on a sunny day. My parents, obviously, always brushed it off as silly crap kids say when I told them what I saw. Oh, don't be silly, or Awa, oh, did you? They never paid it any attention, and why would they? I even remember my father saying something to Mum like, We don't even have a garden known. And she responded that it was just an active imagination. I lived there until I was about 18 or 19, and I don't even think anyone in our street owned garden gnomes at all. It never even once looked at me like he didn't know I was watching or perhaps didn't care. The last time I saw him was about 20 years ago. I'd never spoken about it to anyone but my mother and sister during my adult life, else I'd probably be admitted to a mental health ward. When I asked mum, she still remembers me talking about him when I was little. Most people reading will probably think what a load, but I promise this is true. Was he real? or possibly a fabricated memory of some kind. Why would my mind make me remember fake stuff? Has anyone else ever seen one? This happened in the western suburbs of Sydney, Australia. I spent a lot of time in Africa, both on business and for pleasure. One time there were about eight of us that went camping in a national park in Zambia. I was with a friend and the other six I did not know. There were two other couples and two single females. We spent the afternoon getting to know each other and pitching our tents, had our dinner and retired to our tents for sleep. Around 3 a.m. in the morning, I hear the two females freaking out. There was screaming like I have never heard before. To be honest, I was shitting myself. I thought some animal was attacking them. My adrenaline was pumping like crazy. I always remember hearing that when people are screaming they're okay, it's generally the quiet ones that you should worry about. So I got my torch and found the courage to open up my tent. At this point, the screaming was continuing, and I could now hear scratching noises. The other members of the group were remaining very quiet. I am sure they were just dry-mouthed and did not want to bring attention to their tents. I slowly opened the tent and shone the torch in the direction of the girl's tent, and I saw two hyenas walking around the tent. I know that generally hyenas are generally timid creatures around humans, but they have been known to attack and kill people in rare circumstances. By this time, the guide was out of his tent and simply shouted at the hyenas and they ran off. One of the golden rules of camping in the domain of wild animals is not to keep any food around. Always keep food in sealed containers and make sure everything is clean and washed properly. It turned out that one of the girls has some biltong dried meat in the tent and the hyenas has smelt it and were trying to get at it. This happened quite a time ago, but remember the encounter very well. My mom sent me next door to my grandma's to get something for her when the whole time felt like I was being watched, and looked over my shoulder several times. Now the distance between my house and my grandma's was long enough. Where once I reached my grandma's my home was not visible. The sighting occurred on my way back home. I was about halfway when I saw the creature. It was making a lot of noise and came crashing out of the tree line breaking a huge tree branch. Then it began to run toward me. I remember thinking this can't be happening. I felt like my legs would not move out of fear. It all was in a time span of five to 10 seconds. I then ran the rest of the way home. And I tell you, I have never ran so fast. The next day I took my mom to the site where the creature had come out of the trees and showed her the tree branch. Lots of people I know do not believe in Bigfoot. So I normally would shy away from telling my story. I do know for a fact that what I saw was indeed Bigfoot. Okay, so I'll try to make this relatively short, so I'm not one for believing too much of cryptid lore. Never had an encounter before or anything like that. But my partner and I live on the border of upstate New York, not far from the Whitehall Bigfoot area. One night partner was taking out the garbage and came back inside startled, I mean really shook up. They said they had seen a creature that looked like maybe a fox or coyote, but that it then stood up on its hind legs and so they booked it back inside. Fast forward about a month and I'm outside on my porch, smoking a cigarette, enjoying the stars under a crystal clear sky. We have a small plot next to our house that has a tow behind landscaping trailer permanently parked on it about 20-ish feet away from the house. 
After a while of standing outside, I get the sudden and intense feeling like something is watching me. Just that primal feeling of danger. It should be noted that, like most people up here, I'm usually carrying a gun on me. Coyotes and bears are fairly common up here, so I kind of do the four corners check of my surroundings. When I looked over to that trailer, I saw there was something the size of a large dog laying in the grass. Mind you, it's a clear night with a not quite full moon, and the grass was uncut long, but not like a meadow. If I had to estimate, I'd say seven, nine inches high, so I had a really good view of this thing. Now I know never to approach a random animal bedded down at night, so I just kind of watch it for a second. Even in the light of the moon, its outline and coat were pitch black, blacker than anything I've seen before, unnaturally contrasting against the ground it laid on. Then it looks up, it has piercing red eyes. I'm thinking, aw, oh, what the F, and put my hand on my revolver. I ain't about to be coyote food. And then, it stood up. It stood up on its hind legs. The only way I can describe the legs of it is like that goat-human hybrid from the Narnia movie, but with the torso like a hybrid of man and canine. It was taller than me, and I'm six foot one. It didn't even need to take a step. I flicked whatever was left of my cigarette and backed away to the door, locked and bolted it, and spent the rest of the night wondering what I just saw. Now I'll admit, I'm a religious man, but that thing didn't fit the description of any djinn I've heard of. It's to this day one of the few things in my life I cannot explain we've installed security cameras since but now the lot is under construction, and we haven't seen it since. I don't know what I saw that night, truly, but I intend to find out one way or another. I want to go into the forest near the plot and look for signs. Does anyone have any advice on hunting this sort of cryptid? I'll update with any further happenings should they appear again. My brother and his friends were on the highway one night. It was Highway 73 South in Quebec, Canada, and basically my brother saw what looked like a tall, white pale humanoid near the woods on the side of the road. He also said it was abnormally tall and walking on two legs. At first he didn't think much of it, thinking he was the only one who saw it, and he believed he might have been seeing things due to his tiredness. Until one of his friends who was driving screamed, WTF was that? All four of them saw it. They all described the same thing. I believe it might have been a skinwalker. Thoughts? Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.